The Return of the Highlander, written by Barbara Bard and published by Starfall Publications. Subscribe for more audiobooks. Enjoy. Chapter 1 A clap of thunder echoed off the stone cliffs of the Isle of Mull as Charlotte Browning, newly arrived from Yorkshire to visit with her aunt and uncle to clear her lungs of the dreaded disease of consumption, began to run as fast as she could to escape the sheets of rain that had begun to fall all around her. She had not expected this violent storm, and as she hastened to find shelter, lightning began to tear through the heavens above her, threatening her on every front. Charlotte was not a person who was easily frightened. For several years, contrary to the predictions of the many doctors who had told her parents in hushed tones that she was a terminal case, she had battled this disease known as the wasting disease by some, and tuberculosis by the physicians who were most up to date. She had suffered for years from long nights filled with terrible dreams and terrors, racking coughs and frightful blood-soaked handkerchiefs, until by dint of great effort and determination, the symptoms began to subside. Her doctor, the brilliant young firebrand, Silas Milne, prescribed a rigorous regimen of exercise and fresh air, convinced as he was that it was the awful and dirty air of Sheffield that was most to blame. But Charlotte was determined to make a full recovery against all odds, and it was this that led her to be alone on the Scottish moor, just as this frightening storm descended. Not thirty yards away from the galloping young woman, was an old and gnarled tree, garishly lit up by the flashing blasts of lightning that began to burst around her as she ran. It looked something like an oak tree, Charlotte guessed, but it exploded into a million tiny wood chips as it was hit by a bolt of lightning. In the bright flash from the explosion, she saw a vision before her, something unlike anything she had ever seen before. It resembled a man with long, bright, fiery hair, clad in a colourful tartan dress, the like of which she had never seen before. Hello, she cried, raising her arms. She had a sense this apparition had heard her. In the gathering gloom she lost sight of the vision, and with the smattering of lightning flashes around her, the vision receded without responding. Are you safe? she cried. And then she tried very hard to hear the response, but heard nothing but the howls of the wind and the crack of distant lightning. Shielding her face from the pelting water and the flying pieces of wood, Charlotte slowed her pace as she saw the light from the window of the castle only a few hundred yards away. Perhaps it was a mirage or a spirit she had seen, for she had heard that the lands of Mull were haunted by the spirits of the many who had died here in recent years since the Battle of Culloden Moor. Rather than flee from this inclement weather and the spirits that haunted it, Charlotte embraced it smiling at the feel of the pelting cool raindrops on her face. She tasted the sweet, clean water that fell as a gentle rain from heaven as the storm blew out over the sea. I know I am alive, she said to herself. I know I will live because the Lord has baptised me with the purest water of the Hebrides. Moments later, as she pulled open the large, iron-studded oak door, her Aunt Catherine, the slender reed of a Yorkshire woman, who had married the great barrel-chested Scotsman, Kenneth Campbell, one of the few Scots who had sided with the English and who had reaped the reward of land that had belonged to the Highlanders, greeted her. Although Charlotte knew little or nothing of the history of these islands, the Campbells were reviled by many Highlanders because of their turncoat ways, and Kenneth was one of the worst. A boorish bear of a man, he cared nothing for the crofters who remained on the island and regularly burned their farms to terrorise the local population. Catherine, though, was a kindly woman, soft-spoken and mousy in her demeanour, given to whispering her responses against the bellows that was her husband's customary speech volume. My dear, you are drenched through and through, she said, bustling to fetch a towel to dab the raindrops from her niece's smiling face. Oh, Aunt Catherine, she gushed. It is most exhilarating. I saw the most magical visions out on the heath. Aye, you are wont to see things that men rarely see out there, my dear, she said in an exaggerated stage whisper, for there is more than the natural world at work here on the Isle of Mull. Charlotte was confused. What do you mean, auntie? she asked. The people of this island have long spoken of the spirits of the nether realm, for here there are selkies, a sort of people who shapeshift between human and seal. 
there are spirits that haunt the heath, and there are many, many intercessors to the other world, and most of the people have been here before. Charlotte, who never lacked for imagination, smiled with joy at the possibility of living in a place where angels dare to tread, where those beings who live in the half-believed other world appear and interact with the beings from the natural world. I saw one such spirit, she said excitedly. Her aunt blanched. Nay, she said, you didna. Charlotte was taken with the way her aunt had adopted much of the speech pattern of the noble Highland Scots as some sort of gesture of respect. This was in contrast to Kenneth, who did his utmost to lose his hated Scottish accent. It was a fiery being and beautiful figure, similar to a man, but far more exciting and more handsome than any man I have ever seen, she said, breathing heavily still. There are more things here that you can imagine in your wildest dreams. This very sentence filled Charlotte with joy. This was the most wonderful thing she could imagine. Spirits haunting the heath. Oh, auntie, you cannot imagine how wonderful it is to be here among the spirit world. But beware, Charlotte, for the spirits of the highlands are known to be terrible and vindictive. This spirit seemed friendly enough. Aye, the spirits of the netherworld are a dangerous lot. They can fool you into thinking they are helping you whilst plotting your demise. Again, a shiver went through Charlotte. She was thrilled by this idea and vowed to learn more about the spirits. As her aunt went to get some tea to warm her gullet, Charlotte took her leather-bound notebook from the folds of her skirts and set to work writing down her experience for further reflection. She sat at a small table, alone and lost in her thoughts and reveries as Mary, the young Scottish girl who was employed as a maid, came by. She stood by Charlotte silently watching for several minutes until Charlotte became aware of her. What is it, Mary? asked Charlotte. It's only that the mistress has told about your experience, Miss Charlotte. Please, Mary, I want to be friends. Just call me Charlotte. I will, Miss. Charlotte. Your auntie tells me of your experience on the heath. Tis a boon to see a selkie you can. A boon? Aye. They bear the tidings from the netherworld. You've been Gina Wink into the spirit world. Her Scottish brogue was pronounced and exciting to Charlotte who was thrilled by everything Scottish. I am honoured then, said Charlotte. I tis a boon, but you must find out more about the spirits. Learn all you can so they dinna take you away to live amongst their kith. I shall. That is why I am putting Quill to paper, said Charlotte, to learn about them. A wise thing to do, Miss Charlotte. The Selkies live in the caves aboon the rocks by the sea. I'll explore them tomorrow. She moved away like a ghost, silently and mysteriously. Charlotte picked up her quill and began to write. Chapter 2 The next morning Charlotte rose early in the morning, drank her tea by the window, watching the mist blow out to sea as the wind rose, and decided she would go and explore the caves Mary had told her about. She rose, donned her black hooded cape over her dress, and made her way to the door. On the way, she saw her Uncle Kenneth. I hear you've been exploring the bloody heath, he said, and somehow even his voice sounded threatening. He looked over her, a giant of a man, over six feet tall and thick like a peasant. Something about him made Charlotte cringe, but she fought the tendency because he was her uncle by marriage. Since she arrived, she had heard his violent side from the other room as he drank tumbler after tumbler of Scotch whisky, bellowing his terrible opinions and bitterness into the night. Aunt Catherine, who had married him in his youth, had seen him develop into what can only reasonably be called a hate-filled man. She'd sit quietly and listen to him as he cast aspersions about every Scotsman he knew. They are a scurvy lot, these Celts, he said, swallowing a tumbler full of Scotch whisky. I tell you, they would slay your brother as soon as look at you. You cannot trust a single one of them. Catherine smiled at his awful ideas, knowing there was no longer any hope of returning the carefree young man she had met while on a visit to Edinburgh all those years ago. Yes, dear, she said, and her words seemed to inspire him to a fresh volley of vitriol. 
You can ne'er entrust a thing to a Scotsman. They are a bloodthirsty lot. I have vowed to rid this scourge from the Isle of Mull, he said, getting up and advancing on Catherine, who cowered at the approach of her husband. Charlotte listened, waiting for the sound of violence, and was grateful when all she heard was the shattering of a glass against the stone floor of the great castle floor. Blast! he shrieked. That was the night before, and she suspected his current outburst was inspired by the story she had told of the sighting of the Selkie. For Kenneth was not a superstitious man, but he believed the crofters were undermining his authority. And each time he heard another story, he would organise a party of men to burn one of the thatched roofs of the cottages that were still scattered around the island. Today, though, Charlotte had the innocent idea to investigate the caves around the seashore. I took a wee walk yesterday, but the weather got the better of me, she said, smiling. Somehow her smile inspired him to a rage again. It's a place of evil winds, he said, his huge eyebrows rising up threateningly on his face. The redness of his skin and his tiny pink-ringed blue eyes looked like firebrands on his pockmarked skin. Charlotte tried to imagine the young man Catherine had fallen in love with, but the scourge of smallpox had wrought its disfiguring fury on him, and he no longer bore any resemblance to the portrait she saw hanging in the dining hall. She'd examined it one day and noted that it was inscribed, Sir Kenneth Campbell, Lord of the Isles. She knew this could not be the truth, of course, as the Campbells were not the Lords of the Isles, but she suspected it was an aspirational title rather than a real one. She knew he had been granted Kinlockby Castle, which she knew was the hereditary seat of the Marquess of Lockby, a Maclean who had lost it when the English monarch found him guilty of treason for taking up arms against the Crown. How this came about she did not know, and she dared not ask. She only knew that it had filled her uncle's heart with black rage, and his addiction to the Scottish national drink was not a help in quelling his fury. Thank you, Uncle Kenneth, she said, smiling again. I shall avoid the winds and stray only as far as I feel safe. There's no safe harbour in these parts, he said. Charlotte brushed past him, and as she felt his presence cringe from her, filling her heart with dread. Something was wrong with this man, she knew. Something had turned his heart to stone. She dreaded finding out what it was. She noticed how all the servants were terrified of him, and throughout the castle, a pall was palpable in every corner of the place, as though the stones themselves were at war with this angry man. I thank you, uncle, she said quietly, moving past him. As a response, he spat on the stone floor in front of her. The spittle itself seemed to curdle as it hit the stone. Out on the heath, Charlotte felt her spirit soar as the morning sky had cleared and the sun even seemed disposed to shine. A rare thing on this windswept isle. Her heart lifted, though, and her steps were light. She was truly recovered from her long illness, she felt. The truth was that Charlotte had lost hope of ever living a normal life more than a year ago when fighting the battle against consumption and realising her chances of marrying well were gone. Now that she was twenty-four years old, she was far too thin to be fashionable. Growing up in a manor house in Sheffield with her parents, the Earl of Tremaine, she had thought her fortune rested on finding a suitable partner in a good marriage. Of course, this was the dream of every young lady of her station but being struck with consumption at age 17, most of the gentlemen who might have found her appearance entrancing were repelled by this dreaded disease. And now that she had conquered it, she was, to all intents and purposes, an old maid. Charlotte had come to terms with this appellation and took it in stride. She was grateful for life of any kind, and not the least bit disturbed that she would never have children. Disappointed to be sure, but not terribly worried. As she made her way to the shore, she picked her way gingerly through the rocks that made up the shoreline. She was filled with the spirit of adventure and the sights. As rustic and primordial as they seemed, they filled her romantic heart with happiness. She had long since banished thoughts of romance and replaced them with ambition as a writer. For she had heard about the lady writers who had made their mark on the world without the need of a husband. Eliza Parsons, or even the poetess from Mull, Mayred Nigan Lachlan, 
whose poetry she had found in translation from the Gaelic tongue. Charlotte found a welcoming rock on which to sit and opened her notebook. She began to read her reminiscences from the day before. And lo, I made my way through the heath, in this wild, windswept isle, as the storm that had been brewing off the coast made landfall. A hoary wind began to blow, and with it the brusque fires from heaven began to wreak their havoc on the land. Lightning bolts, aimed with deadly precision, struck one age-old sentinel, an oak tree, portending the fall of the empire. She smiled at her ambition and her overwrought prose. She was a poetess in the tradition of Lachlan, after all, she mused. But there amid the fury of the gale arose a sprite, emerging as from the flames, with hair of purest red and a costume of rare manufacture. He was well made and handsome, but as from the nether regions of the spirit realm, a selkie, as Mary the Scotswoman called him, a creature neither man nor beast but something in between. Home to him were the crags of the coast, the warrens of the beasts, and yet to me he was the handsomest of men. She looked up from her notebook and pondered what should happen next in her narrative, smiling at her unique genius. Closing her eyes, she felt the breeze blow through her dark tresses and felt the beauty of the North Sea, much as she imagined the Frankenstein monster must have felt his freedom in the wind. Charlotte was a creative soul, and the joy of immersing herself in the wilds of the Hebrides filled her heart with ideas of narrative originality. And then all of a sudden, she spied him again. That fiery sprite she had only glimpsed in the flash of the lightning was there before her, not two hundred yards off. Instinctively she waved. He had clearly seen her, as he had just emerged from the woods, and she was clearly sitting high on a crag by the water. She was bewildered by the lack of a response. Hello, she called. He clearly heard her because his head swivelled around in her direction. She saw, all of a sudden, his face clearly and unmistakably human, and terribly, terribly ruggedly handsome. Even at some distance off she could see that he was a stunning specimen of a man. He was clad in a tartan kilt and a plaid, a tam upon his head, holding down a mane of bright red hair that flew in the breeze like fire. Charlotte was smitten instantly, for he was unlike any man she had ever seen before. He was tall and broad-shouldered, with powerful arms and legs perfectly muscled. He moved like a wild animal, stealthily and swiftly, his hair blowing in the wind. His rugged face was bearded with a soft, downy beard of light brown hair. He had a beautifully straight nose and a strong jaw that gave him the look of great strength and intelligence. And his huge eyes, those windows to his soul, also allowed great wisdom to emanate from them. He froze in place, standing there by the seashore, staring at the raven-haired maiden who was sitting by the shore. There was some feral instinct that seemed to be confused by her presence. He seemed to be drawn to her, but some deeply ingrained fear caused him to retreat, as Charlotte called to him with a smile on her lips. She saw this attraction in his eyes, yet also the fear, the worry of an unknown quantity in his life. Suddenly, as she rose to approach him, he bolted like a wolf. Scarcely had she gotten to her feet when she noticed he had vanished, much faster than any man could possibly have left. A sense of wonder pervaded her imagination, and she sat again to write down her impressions of this wild-haired Adonis. Her mind raced with thoughts as mad as the vision she had just seen. She knew there was no man like this on the island, and yet she saw twice with her own eyes that he was real. This realisation, along with her sense of herself as a creative spirit, filled her with the spirit of the Chosen. And with that, he vanished. Charlotte leaned into her notebook and scribbled as fast as she could to capture this moment of wonder and magic engendered by this figure she had seen on the shore. Where he had gone was a mystery, and in her mind he was taken up into the heavens. All that was left was her smile as wide as the heavens itself. Chapter 3 That very night, as she made her way back to Kinlochby Castle, Charlotte felt as though her feet barely touched the ground. She was transported with the feeling of one who had been touched by an angel. 
Entering the castle, she made her way to her chambers where she deposited her notebook by her bed and changed into a dress more appropriate for dining. She chose a ruby gown embroidered with golden designs along the hem, with long, narrow sleeves ending in a wide lace. The dress was split down the front, exposing her sky-blue satin underdress. It was a beautiful gown, chosen especially for her journey up to the Scottish islands by her mother, who had hoped she would be inspired by the wild landscape. This dress was one of her best. She made her way to the long dining hall, noticing the long table that had doubtless been used to entertain the great chieftains of the Highlanders. Today, however, it was only for her aunt and uncle and herself seated at the far end of the table. Sir Kenneth and Lady Catherine were already seated as she entered the room. Catherine rose, welcoming her, while Kenneth remained seated, ignoring her entrance in a most impolite manner. She noticed that he had a half-empty bottle of scotch at his elbow and a stout tumbler of thick glass. He appeared to have enjoyed some of this liquor already, for his eyes were hazy with the bitterness that is so often the result of the amber liquid. Well, said Kenneth, I see you've finally seen fit to join us. Charlotte was taken aback by this angry outburst. At first she was tempted to respond to it with anger, but seeing his already angry demeanour, she decided to let it go. And how was your day, Aunt Catherine? she asked, turning to her aunt. Well, I had a very nice day, Charlotte, she said in something akin to a whisper. Speak up, woman, yelled Sir Kenneth. You're like a wee mouse with your whispering. Pardon me, my dear, she said, cowering. And what mischief have you been up to today, Charlotte? bellowed Sir Kenneth, turning to her. I saw the spirit man again today, she offered. The what? In truth, I know not what he was, but I have been told it was a selkie, she responded. Rubbish, cried Sir Kenneth. There's no such a thing. If you saw something, you saw a villain, a sheep stealer, or a cattle thief, some brigand, sure as shooting. Well, I'm sure I know not what he was, but he was a very pleasant sight indeed, clad in a red tartan and kilt. Then it's surely a rebel from the clan Maclean, he said, leaning into her and quaffing yet another glass of the poison he so enjoyed. A rebel, said Charlotte. I thought they had been routed from this island. They have, for the most part, and that tartan is a sign of their villainy. These rebels want to unseat me from the castle, and by God they'll meet with resistance if they lift a hand against me. I'll not countenance rebellion in my lands. I must say, uncle, he seemed a most friendly sort. Did he approach you then? He did not. Indeed, he made off when I greeted him from a distance. Aye, they're a scurvy lot, those Macleans. Canna let the past be the past. They bear their grievances and their bloodlust agin me. When he was angry, Charlotte noticed his Scottish brogue was on full display. How was he clad? he stormed. Charlotte furrowed her brow and took a sip of the blood-red wine before her. Its acrid flavour cleared her head, and she pondered her memory of the man. I believe he was clad in a red and green tartan kilt, and a plaid over his shoulders, and a tam o' shanter upon his head. He wore tartan hose too, and high black leather boots. If I remember well, he had at his side a claymore, one of those broadswords that I hear the Highlanders use in battle, and perhaps he had a bow and arrows, held in a quiver. Kenneth laughed grotesquely. Well then, my little dear, what you saw was a Highlander bent on our destruction. These are to be feared and the only way to rid ourselves of this scourge is to cut them down like dogs. He spat on the ground as though to punctuate his utterance. I do not know what he was. I only know what I saw. And he looked friendly and not like a bloodthirsty Highlander, said Charlotte quietly. I see, thundered Sir Kenneth. And you are an expert now on the bloodthirsty Scots then, are you? You wee sleek and timorous beastie, he guffawed. You'd not know your own murderer if you saw him plain as day. He emptied the last of the scotch into his glass and tossed it down his throat, then threw the bottle to the floor where it shattered dramatically. Mary, he bellowed even louder than the shattered glass, just as Mary, having heard the shattering glass, leapt into the room. I'll take care of the shards, she said. Will you need another bottle, my lord? Does a fish need water? 
Does a wolf need its prey? By God, I'll have another bottle, or I'll have your head, he shrieked, his head clearly swimming from the effects of the drink. Mary scampered off and returned with a broom in a moment. She made short work of the broken glass and placed a bottle of scotch on the table. Bring it here, wench, yelled Sir Kenneth. And where is the dinner? I've made a wee haggis, my lord, said Mary. I'll fetch it in. We apportion a neeps. Can you no speak English, then, you slut? Sir Kenneth bellowed at Mary. I'll no abide that tongue in this castle, for we are part of Great Britain and the language of Britannia is English, not this misbegotten tongue you call Scots. Not another word or I'll have you thrashed. Charlotte was taken aback by this anger. She had seen Sir Kenneth angry before, but he seemed to have grown angrier with every word she said. They ate in silence. The haggis was flavoured with a delicate nutmeg, and it was of exquisite quality. What is this dish, Mary? asked Charlotte. It's a lovely blend of oats and sheep offal, she said quietly. It's a disgusting mess of guts and oatmeal, not fit for a dog, shrieked Uncle Kenneth, tossing the pewter plate to the floor with a crash, spilling the haggis over the stone floor. My darling, said Catherine, if you don't like the haggis, we can have a nice roast made for you. Mary looked shocked as though someone expected her to produce a roast at a moment's notice. Her eyes dashed from face to face, desperate for something to say or do to save her neck. I'll have no other meat, he said. Bring me some oat cakes and cheese. Mary heard this with a sigh. Yes, my lord, she said, scampering off to fetch the cheese and oat cakes. Charlotte finished her meal in silence as Sir Kenneth stewed and angrily grunted while crunching on his oat cakes. From time to time he made indistinguishable grunts and roars, while Charlotte looked to her aunt for guidance on how to behave. Catherine, for her part, seemed to know that there was no conversation to be had at a dinner that was presided over by a drunken Sir Kenneth, and did her best not to bait the bear that he had become. When she had finished, Charlotte rose. Might I be excused? she asked, not knowing to whom she was addressing this request. Be off wi ye, said a clearly drunken Sir Kenneth. Gee oot me sight, he drawled angrily, tossing his plate in her direction, narrowly missing her. Charlotte scampered off to her bedchambers, closing and locking the door behind her. She was genuinely afraid that Sir Kenneth would be coming after her, and she could not guess what would happen if he did. Safe within her chambers, she opened her notebook and reread the passage about the beautiful young man she had seen, dreaming of salvation at his hands. She smiled at the thought and began to write further, inspired by the fiery anger of Sir Kenneth and wondering why he had such anger in his soul. She suspected he had lost his way and no longer followed the one true path of salvation. She had heard that the Scots had a version of Christianity informed by the Roman Church and infused with the animism she had seen on display in the references to selkies and sprites. She took her Bible and thumbed through it nervously, trying to find a way to calm herself. She opened it to Leviticus 4, where she began to read in hopes it would offer her solace. If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbour, then he shall restore that which he took. He shall even restore it in the principle and shall add the fifth part more thereto, and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. She closed the book, pondered the meaning of these words, and realised there was something terribly amiss in this household. For by his own admission, Sir Kenneth had taken away the lands of the Maclean's, and it had poisoned his soul. What must be done, though? she asked herself. For I am but a weak woman, and cannot stand up to Sir Kenneth, who is a brute and a drunkard. And yet I must do something, for to stand by and watch another sin is to sin oneself. Doubling down, she wrote her thoughts in her notebook, praying Sir Kenneth would never see it. Of course, she reminded herself that Sir Kenneth was not known to be a reader. In fact, she doubted that he was even able to read. Although, according to Aunt Catherine, he had been a fine gentleman in his youth before the smallpox had driven him turning his heart to bitterness and revenge against a perceived wrongdoer. Before she knew what she was writing, she had fallen asleep. In her dream, Charlotte was wandering by the seashore, and a warm wind cooled her as she basked in the sunshine. 
It was a warm day, and the beauty of the earth was on full display. She sat herself on the soft and warm sand that surrounded her, and she closed her eyes, feeling the warm breeze on her neck. And in that same moment, she felt a firm hand on her arm. She opened her eyes and looked straight into the soul of the Highlander, clad in his beautiful kilt and plaid. You are my destiny, he said, his voice melodic in the wood-note tones of the Scottish braes. If you'll coom wi' me, bonnie lassie, I'll show ye a life of great beauty. Without a word, Charlotte took his hand and embraced him there on the beach. His soft beard caressed her face as she kissed his soft red lips. Who are you, fair Highlander? she asked softly. I am the man you've dreamt of your life long, he replied. Yes, you are, she enthused. And as he led her along the beach, she noticed a beautiful manor only a short distance away, where liveried servants awaited their approach. And what is this place, my prince? she said dreamily. My lassie, this is your hame, for we'll be married this very day if you'll pledge me your word. I give it with all my heart, fair Highlander, she replied. And standing before the manor house, in the presence of the liveried servants, she and the wild Highlander kissed again as he took her in his arms and held her as though his life depended on it. Softly, he took her to a huge down-filled bed, covered with soft furs of fine ermine, and gently and lovingly he laid her down, smothering her with kisses. I love you, my wild Highlander, she murmured, and yea, my bonnie lass, you are the one and only for me. I love ye, darling Charlotte, he replied, kissing her on her bare neck and caressing her breasts. She felt herself rising off the bed as though she were floating, still entwined in his powerful arms, and she grasped him by his broadly muscled forearms and pulled herself into his embrace. She knew at the moment that heaven was at hand. There was a sudden crack as though the front door was being battered by a battering ram, and Charlotte was awakened with a jolt. Her dream dissipated suddenly, and like a shattered glass it tinkled into a million pieces, none of them distinguishable as anything but a weapon of war. She sat bolt upright in her bed, terrified by the violent sound, and listened for another hint as to what was happening. Nothing. It was quiet as a tomb in the castle but she was certain she had heard something hitting the heavy iron-studded oak front door. Taking the candle, she had lit from beside her bed. She flew to her own door and pulled the deadbolt aside and flung the door open. Silently, she made her way, in bare feet, through the cold stone corridor of the castle toward the front door. In the flickering light of the candle, the walls were eerie and ominous, so unlike the manner of her dreams. Heavy flagstones were the floor, and the cold was almost unbearable on her feet. Yet she arrived at the entrance hall and examined the door. It appeared to be intact and undisturbed. She put her hand on the door to feel any disruption to the wood. It seemed solid. Gingerly she slid the latch open and opened the three locks that held the door secure. Putting the candle on a table beside the door, she heaved it open. It opened onto the heath, and in the moonlight, covered over with fleeting clouds, she saw only the barren lands. Not a soul was outside as far as she could see, and not a living thing stirred. She listened for a sound but heard nothing. Only the wind. Gently she pushed the door closed, the creaking of the hinges the only sound. Gently and carefully she replaced the locks into their position and fastened the latch, picked up the candle, and in great bewilderment she returned to her room. There. She closed and locked the door and returned to her bed. For the remainder of the night, she slept fitfully, worried that someone or something would invade her sleep. In the morning, she rose, feeling unrefreshed. She splashed cold water from the basin by her window on her face. The cold water on her skin made her brace herself for another day with the raging bull that was Sir Kenneth. With a sigh, she made her way to the dining room. Chapter 4 Charlotte found herself drawn to the sea. It was only a few hundred yards from the front door of Kinlochboy Castle, 
and something about the throbbing, repetitive nature of the gently washing waves attracted her. This day was a beautiful day in August, and she knew the weather would be fair all day, and so she felt the freedom to explore the island more than she had before. And of course she felt a strong desire to be away from her uncle, whose behaviour at dinner the night before had disturbed her terribly. Stepping between the large boulders of the shore was difficult, but rewarding to Charlotte. She hiked up her dress and stepped from rock to rock, noticing the teeming life at the water's edge. There were frogs and newts teeming among the rocks and the brackish water there, as well as small crabs and prawns that hid among the algae in the deeper water. As she looked out over the bay, there was a disturbance in the water. It was difficult to know exactly what it was, and with all the talk of selkies, she was unsure what exactly she was seeing. It was only a matter of time, though, until the mystery was solved, because a dolphin or a porpoise broke the surface and flew into the air. This appearance was shocking to Charlotte, because it happened so close to her, where the water was clearly deep but worryingly near at hand. And as the animal splashed again into the water, she could almost feel the spray that came over the water. And before she knew it, the animal was making its way slowly toward her, as though she had piqued its curiosity. This phenomenon was surprising to her as Charlotte had always believed that the animal kingdom was separate and different from the realms of mankind. But this animal was behaving like a person, and she knew all of a sudden how it was not difficult to imagine a very close relationship between the animal kingdom and that of man. This porpoise, huge and bulky though it was, looked at her with surprisingly human eyes, smiling in her direction like a kindly uncle basking in the water. Suddenly Charlotte was overcome with a strange feeling, an attraction that she did not understand, luring her back to the land. She looked in the direction of the place the dolphin was pointing with its beak, and although she could not know what this force was, when she looked to where she was being drawn, she saw something there between the rocks a little bit above the water level. It was a dark patch that appeared somehow different from the rest of the shoreline. It was dark and empty. She rose and began to walk toward it. As she did, the dolphin increased its chattering. The closer she got to this thing, the more the dolphin chittered, and the closer she got, the more ominous this opening became. It became clear after she neared it that it was a cave mouth, and it appeared that there may have been something or someone who had been there recently. She looked around to see if there was anyone around, but Mull was sparsely populated in that part of the island, and so, as usual, she was all alone. It was, in fact, one of the things she liked most about the island and the thing that appeared to do best for her recovery. Since she had appeared here, she had hardly spoken to a sowl, and this solitude, along with the lovely light breezes and fresh air, was the major reason she felt she was gaining strength and vitality so quickly. She had noticed, in fact, that her gaunt face had begun to show the effects of a good diet and fresh air. Her skin had regained the pinkish hue that she had aspired to for so many years and her once angular face had become quite beautiful now that it had rounded out. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Approaching the mouth of the cave, she noticed that the ground, though pebbled, appeared to be well trod. It made her suspect that a large animal, perhaps a bear, may be inhabiting this rather large cave. In order to avoid any unpleasant encounter, and knowing very little about bears, Charlotte stopped and made her way to the shore where she looked about for a thick branch that might serve as a brand to light her way in the darkness of the cave. The dolphin was still chittering away close to her, and as she looked about, she found a short length of wood that had washed up on the beach many days before. It had been sun-bleached and dried by the largely dry weather they had been having recently, with the exception of that frightful lightning storm a few nights earlier. Taking a flint that she had in her satchel, she struck it against a rock to make a spark and lit a small taper, holding it up to this piece of wood, which, in a matter of minutes, lit up like a candle. She took the stick and held it aloft as she clambered into the dark cave. 
And it was a very rewarding search too, for inside the cave she found a room which bore the signs of human modification. Although the cave had a high ceiling, the floor had been flattened by human hands, and it now resembled a room. Indeed, a little further along this room she could see that there was another room-like opening. Charlotte was not a timid person, but never having encountered a bear was neither in the mood to meet one today. However, she found a spot to put the brand into an opening in the wall, giving light around her. She sat on an outcropping that served her as a seat. Looking around this magical place, she could hear the sea, much the way a seashell could sing when held up to the ear. Only this was a large cave and the sound was far more soothing. Sitting in this dimly illuminated space, she felt a sense of calm descend on her in a way that she had not felt since she was a child. This was her hiding place, somewhere that Kenneth could never find her in time of need. Sitting here, her solitude became a welcome visitor, and she withdrew her notebook from her satchel and took out a pencil, one of the things she had brought with her from Yorkshire. Although it was more difficult to use than a quill, she felt more comfortable using this than she did with ink and quills. Happily, she began to write. Inspired as she was by the writings of the ladies she had been reading of late, there was nothing quite so inspiring in any of her books as this cave. It is like the great Scottish hero, Robert the Bruce, who, while hiding from Edward Longshanks before the Battle of Bannockburn, was hiding in a cave not unlike this one. It too, she wrote, was on a lonely, windswept island in the North Sea. Defeat had dogged him at every turn, and he felt close to despair. He spied a spider, high above him on a beam. The small spider tried to hurl itself to a neighbouring beam but failed. Robert counted its attempt six times. If this spider fails on the seventh attempt, then I, like this spider, shall abandon my seventh attempt to take Scotland, he vowed. And there, in that lonely cave, he watched the spider hurl its little body into the void and clutch furtively onto the beam. There it placed its thread and began a large web. It succeeded, he said to himself, and I too shall set out and try once again. From there, Robert the Bruce came out of hiding, gathered his great Scottish army and routed the English from the land. He became King of Scotland, known as Robert the Good and led his people to a great time of wealth and peace. Charlotte smiled at her little story. It was good and she was clearly inspired, although the branch had begun to sputter a little. Suddenly she heard a noise like an animal. It was a sound like a scattering of rocks, and her ears perked up, listening for something that would signal danger to her. The harder she listened, the less she could hear, though, except for the sounds of the sea. She rose, thinking the bear she feared may have returned. Another noise was heard. In her haste, as the branch finally went out, plunging her into darkness, she scampered over the rocks to the cave's opening. With a sense of desperation, she looked around, and seeing no one, calmed herself a little. She smiled at her foolishness. I am, after all, a silly girl, she scolded herself. But then she definitely heard a sound. It was the sound of rustling in the nearby forest. Desperately, she looked for an escape in the event that the bear charged out of the forest, thinking she was invading its home, and dashed over the large rocks of the shoreline in the direction of the castle. Before she could encounter this fearsome bear, she ran as fast as her feet would carry her, and didn't stop until she was on the well-kept grounds of the castle. She had impressed herself with her daring and good health. She was able to run swiftly, and she had no fear of wild animals, even in a dangerous cave that was unknown to any other living soul. As she walked briskly to the castle door, she realised she had forgotten her notebook in the cave. Oh, bother, she said to herself. I do hope I shall be able to retrieve it tomorrow. Then she smiled at her affectation. She had begun to take on the speech patterns of the heroines of her novels, and started to lose any sense that she was a grown woman living in Scotland in the late 1740s. She laughed at herself and vowed not to give in to these sentimental notions. Back in her room, she prepared herself for the awful possibility of another frightful luncheon with Aunt Catherine and Uncle Kenneth, hoping he would be able to control his fiery temper for an hour of good conversation.
particularly now that she had much to relate. Nevertheless, she vowed to tell no one about the discovery of the cave. This was to be her haven in case of trouble or worry. She lay down on her bed for a moment and let her eyes close, waiting for lunch. Chapter 5 Colin MacLean, self-styled Laird of the Isles, and Marquis of Lochby, had been dispossessed by the Highland clearances. He had fought bravely at the Battle of Culloden, under the leadership of Bonnie Prince Charlie, who commanded the cavalry forces on the moor. Colin rode his horse and took up arms against the English and the butcher they called Stinking Billy and the English Sweet William. It was an hour he would never forget. Bogged down and sweating, bullets flying overhead, and his horse mired in the bog, he urged his steed onward until there was nowhere left to charge. He watched as his countrymen were cut down in a hail of bullets. And then the grape shot began, filling the air and cutting down even more of his countrymen, the Chisholms and the McLaughlins, with terrible wounds. He decided there was no winning this battle when he saw his own countrymen, the Campbells, attacking his comrades. There was nothing to do but flee back to his young wife, where he vowed to survive and take care of his family. His father had died years before, and Colin had full command of Mull. His young wife, Morag, a beautiful young maiden and daughter of Hamish McLaughlin, had married him the year before in a ceremony that was attended by all the thanes in the Highlands. It was here that they decided to stand with Charles Edward Stuart to take back their country. Inspired by his passionate love for Morag and his country, Colin vowed fealty to the passionate young prince who had gathered an army and marched on London, only to turn back, inexplicably, the year before. His sister, Flora, had also married several years before. She chose Colin's best friend and steward, Duncan Macfarlane. Together, they had a son, Angus, who was brilliant and resourceful but only five years old. Together, they decided there was nothing to do but race to the Isles, along with Bonnie Prince Charlie, who was dressed in women's clothing to hide his identity and help him escape to Skye. On their return from battle, the damage was apparent. Many foot soldiers who had volunteered were dead, with many families broken. There had been an attack by a rogue band of English soldiers on his own household. They had invaded the Great Hall, and his wife Morag, a fiery woman at the best of times, came at them in the absence of any men and slew two of them with the family broadsword before a cowardly third soldier ran her through with his epi. She bled to death on the floor of the Great Hall. When Colin returned, he was met with this grisly sight. As he would often remember, there is no way to describe the feeling of loss when you see the love of your life murdered, surrounded by her own blood. He had not known what had happened, and while he was filled with sadness and grief, he was also filled with anger and the need to avenge her wrongful death. A Highlander is a passionate man, but cruelty and violence perpetrated against his kin inspires him with an unquenchable need for vengeance. Colin, whose passion for Morag was matched only by his love of the land, was filled with hatred for his English conquerors. Those crofters who had managed to live on proved to be his greatest aid in his time of need. For the English soldiers who had come and taken over his castle were routed and killed by the lowly sheep farmers who lived around him. And on his return, he did his best to bring things back for them, fighting through his grief. It was three months of relative peace, a precarious feeling, given the rumours that were swirling of a thing they were calling the Highland Clearances that Stinking Billy's soldiers were perpetrating. We must prepare for war again, said Duncan as they sat at dinner in the dining hall. Flora and Angus were silently watching the two powerful men. There's no end until the Sassanac is routed. Aye, you have thou right, my brather, said Colin, sipping his goblet of wine. While they are a boon us, there's nay peace. I say we raise an army and return to London, said Flora, causing both Duncan and Colin to laugh. Bonnie Prince Charlie had that idea and it went poorly, said Duncan. And much as I love you, my fair Flora, those days of adventure and invasion are over. We must protect the Isle, and that means staying put. Well, if you'll be cowards, I'll have nay truck wi' you, she said, disgusted. Flora. Surely you'll have heard the rumours that there is thirty thousand pounds at the head of Charlie. 
I'll have none of my house known as traitors, she declared during the meeting of the clansmen in Kinlockby Castle. If I hear of a single Scotsman who betrays our king, I'll slay him myself. And for months they tried their best to keep things running smoothly, despite the roaming bands of turncoats and Englishmen who threatened their daily lives. It was difficult to keep the faith, partly because it was to this very castle that Charles arrived in August of 1746, dirty and unkempt, cutting quite a pathetic figure. I need transport, was the first thing he said, for I am being pursued every moment of every day by the Sassanac. We've heard about your misadventures, my king, he said, but we've no means to protect your highness on the island, for as ye ken, there are roving bands of English threatening our crofters daily. And there's a rumour that there's a turncoat lowlander who's been given deed to this very doon. I'll arrange a party for you, my king, to take you forth to meet the Frenchies. I'd be most grateful. I'll be spirited away to France, and I shall arrange an invading force from thence. Aye, that is the best plan, said Colin, looking to his thanes to agree. He looked around the hall and saw sceptical faces. We'll need a wee moment to convene and discuss how to make this a right, Your Highness. Very well, said Bonnie Prince Charlie, rising as all the thanes rose with him. He was ushered into an adjoining room, allowing the men to discuss the merits of keeping him hidden. There's a cave doon by the shore, said Duncan Macfarlane, his faithful steward and his brother-in-law. We can keep him safe there, away from the hands of the Sassanac. I know nothing about a cave said Colin, sure it me. And the troop went to inspect the cave by the water, for the bonny prince to hide out in until such time as his boat arrived to carry him away. It was this very cave he chose himself, when only a few weeks later, a party of armed men came to take over the castle. Charlie had been safely taken to Skye, and so there was no immediate worry for the country. But one night, as Colin sat down to dinner with his sister and his trusted thanes, a sentry interrupted them to tell them that the thing they had been expecting for months was at hand. There's a party of men, English by their attire, approaching with evil intent, he said breathlessly. We must fight or abandon hope. Nay, said Duncan, for Charlie is hid away in the cave. We should meet them and fight. All the thanes gathered their weapons and prepared for battle. They sallied forth into the moor, in the direction of this party of English foot soldiers. Colin and Duncan had fine horses. With their men gathered around them, they charged, unaware of the cannons set up on a ben only a hundred yards away. As they descended on the English, the cannons began to fire from both sides. They knew at that moment resistance would be useless, but as the foot soldiers began to flee, Duncan spurred his horse onward. A bullet pierced his horse's side, causing it to fall, and Duncan to be thrown over its head, tumbling onto the green. Duncan! he shouted, trying to alert his friend to the fact that the English were advancing protected by the cannon fire. Duncan looked up from his resting place and it was clear that his leg was broken. His horse was in agony, thrashing about, and before Colin could come to his aid, an errant hoof crushed his friend's skull. Colin, finding himself outmanned and outgunned, turned and fled. The English on foot came after him, but he evaded them and raced back to the castle. Colin found his sister and her young son in the castle preparing weapons for the fight. Flora, he cried, do come with me. We must away at once. I'll stay and fight, she declared. Flora, I love your pluck, but this is no a fight we can win. Not yet, in any case. We must repair to the cave and sit out this battle. She looked at him with something akin to hatred flickering on her face. I love you, my brother, but you know this is not wise counsel. I can, he replied, but there's the wee bairn to be thought about. Come with me and I'll keep us alive. Flora took a quiver filled with razor-sharp arrows and a large bow from the wall and slung it over her shoulder. I'll go wee, my brother, but you must promise me you'll fight to retake what is ours by divine right. Ye have my word, he said solemnly. Together the three of them set off for the cave. Colin held a brand to light their way in the darkness. As they approached the cave, they were surprised that it had been turned into a home for the prince, decorated in the inner cave with carpeting and beds, 
tables, chairs and a number of brands as well as a large cache of tallow candles, several whale oil lanterns and stores of provisions. They didn't spare a thing for the wee prince then, did they? said Flora with a smile. This cave is a cosier spot than the castle for its drafts. It's like a wee hideaway, said Angus with glee. I love it. Colin settled down in the cave, making sure the family was well fed and watered. He discovered there was a spring that sprang from the rock in the outer cave, and he gathered water in many of the bottles that had been left behind by Prince Charlie. Wine bottles, he guessed. There was not a single wine bottle left full, though, he observed with a wry grin. And the family observed the usurpers, a notorious Highland turncoat named Kenneth Campbell with his English wife. Unbeknownst to the illegitimate residents of Kinlochby Castle, Colin and Flora watched their comings and goings with great care, preparing for the day when they would be able to take it back. All through the cold winter, they warmed themselves with only the lamps and the great warm plaids they had in the cave. Daily, around dusk, Colin would venture into the woods in search of the plentiful red deer that was so common on the island. For this task, he dared not use a gun, and so he hunted in the manner of his ancestors with bow and arrow, silently catching his prey. He never dared take a sheep, knowing as he did that the crofters were encouraged to turn their farms into sheep farms. From time to time he was blessed with a gift from one of them of a cut of mutton, but for the most part they subsisted on venison, which was delicious and plentiful, along with the large cache of oatmeal they had in the cave. All through the winter they observed the comings and goings of the usurpers. As time went on, their clothing became threadbare and needed to be replaced. With the pelts of the deer, Flora learned to cure leather, so it was not so desperately tough, and managed to create shoes of good quality for the three of them. She fashioned a pair of high boots for Colin, who tied them with leather thongs she had made with leather too, crisscrossing his powerful legs. But, for many months, they managed to subsist and thrive. Flora managed to teach Angus to read both in English and in Gaelic, with the books that had been put there for Prince Charlie, but which he had left uncut. It was late afternoon in the summer of the next year that their peace and comfort was interrupted. Was that? said Flora. It was the middle of the day when they were accustomed to sleeping, and all three of them were dozing. But it was undeniable. There was a sound and it was coming from the outer room of the cave. The babbling of the spring did not cover the fact that there was a noise, and this was something they all were wary of. Once or twice an animal had invaded their territory, once a mole and once an otter, but both had become dinner for the cave-dwelling highlanders. The otter was delicious, Angus declared, the mole less so. Hide yourselves away, said Colin, gesturing to them to get to the back of the cave. This was their worst nightmare come alive. Flora and Angus crept into the shadows at the back of the cave while he moved to the shadows as he crept toward the opening to the outer cave room. And there he saw her, up close, for the first time. The same beautiful young woman with raven hair and the most perfect alabaster skin he had ever laid eyes on. She was sitting on a rock, writing in a leather-bound journal book, her slender fingers dancing over the page with a small piece of wood that resembled a quill, except that it required, inconceivably, no ink. This strange phenomenon was what moved him to get closer, and as he moved toward the opening, he failed to notice a pile of rocks near the opening that Angus had carelessly built as a sort of childish cairn. Regardless of its purpose, it was in the way, and in the darkness of the cave, Colin's eyes missed it, but his toe did not. It toppled when he hit it, causing a loud noise that startled the beautiful young woman who was writing in the cave. She leapt to her feet and grabbed the fiery branch she had been using to light the cave, which had been wedged into a cranny in the wall. She was wearing spectacles, and as she looked intently in his direction, he crouched down to avoid detection. Her ears were pricked and her eyes staring intently. Slowly, she began to back out of the cave. He noticed she had left the leather notebook behind. Colin waited for a few minutes until he was certain the young lady had gone, and then he crept into the daylight. He saw she had made her way to the castle, and realising she had invaded his safe place while living in his former castle, 
Indignation rose in his soul. How dare she, he said to himself. It was all he could do to fight off the fury that had invaded his heart. Watching her walk to the large front door that until a year before had protected his family from marauders made his stomach turn, and the fury in his heart almost made him want to charge and batter it until he forced the invaders out into the light of day to meet him in hand-to-hand -hand combat, except that he knew there was no man in that house brave enough to face him. He knew about this Kenneth Campbell, a weak man who turned against his own people by siding with stinking Billy, who had reaped his rewards of stolen lands and property. This woman, lovely as she was, was kin to this coward, and so he swore to find out how to make sure she didn't find out anything about him. In fact, he was unsure she had even learned anything about him or where he was living. He only knew she had been too close to his safe place. Returning to the cave, he noticed she had left her book behind. This filled his heart with dread. Look at this, said Flora, brandishing the book. The lass was writing. Ooh, look at this, Colin. She's a writer. Well, you know what this means? What? he said. She'll be back to fetch it forthwith. We must find another place to live. Wait a minute, Flora, said Colin. Gee it here. Flora stopped prancing around the room and handed the book over. Colin opened it. He began to read. It was beautiful. It was sensitive. And it was not the sort of thing he would have expected from a young woman who was related to the usurper. I shall return it to her, said Colin, looking up from the writing. Are you mad, brother? said Flora. You dinna ken where she lives or anything. Aye, but I do, Flora. I watched her. She's from the Doon, for the household of the usurper. Flora's smile ran away from her face. Her eyes turned to slits of hatred. This is much worse than I had thought, she said. She needs to be slain. Now wait a minute, Flora, said Colin, who had noticed the young woman had been writing about a mysterious red-headed man in glowing terms. Afore we do anything rash, we should find Oot more aboot her. Aye, I suspect that's wise, she agreed. I'll gay and find Oot. I'm silent as the grave. You'll doubtless toss something on the ground and rustle up an army agin us. Colin laughed. I'll do no such thing, he said, and I'll be damned before I allow a wee lass to do a man's work. He took the book from her hands, and as the evening was beginning to descend, he made his way by way of the forest to the back cellar door of Kinlochby Castle, to an entrance he was quite certain was unknown to its current residents. As he waited for the noises from the kitchen to cease, he opened the book, hidden away in the cellar, and read her words by the light of the little window. This mysterious stranger put me in mind of a wild man such as I have read about in the writings of Daniel Defoe, except he had an exquisite silhouette and a leg so beautifully crafted one would have thought he was a Grecian marble statue. His gait was manly rather than beastly, and his broad chest put one in mind of a desperately sensual being, more god than man. If I should have the good fortune to meet this Adonis, I should surely swoon for his ignorance of the niceties of our civilization must be matched only by his wild animal heart. This is the sort of savage one finds in this wilderness of the Hebrides. This is the magic one encounters among these Picts. For they are a comely lot, far more beautiful to behold than we English who are a piteous race, given to bandy legs and thin necks. By contrast, the Celt, and this one most particularly, are a handsome race with great nobility even in the face of defeat. Mary, my maid, is one such noble example of her race, for she bows to no one despite the threats from my Uncle Kenneth, and she makes me proud when she refers to me as Miss Charlotte rather than Lady Charlotte Browning as she should do. But this insolence is not so much insolence as pride, and despite her bondage to my uncle, I know she is still a creature like my wild red-headed god of the highlands, which I am growing to love with a profound connection. Colin smiled as the sun set and made it too dark for him to read further. He told himself he would take the necessary precautions to ensure he was not seen, and with that thought in mind, he removed his kilt and his plaid, leaving his chest bare and only a pair of pale short trousers to cover his nakedness. If I am to be a wild Pict, 
then by God she shall see me as God intended. He laughed to himself. Then he made his way through the abandoned halls of the castle, in a route known to him but to no one else, and stopped in front of the dining hall where he could hear angry male voices raised in fury. Chapter 6 Inside the castle dinner was being served. As usual there was loud talking in the dining hall, because Sir Kenneth had spent the afternoon drinking his favourite drink. By the time the meal was to be served, he was well into his cups as the Scottish servants whispered. In truth, although they did their jobs as they were taught, there was no love lost between this turncoat and the faithful servants of Kinlochby Castle. They missed their former lives, and every chance they got, they voiced their wistfulness among themselves while maintaining the highest degree of service. And this meal was no different from any of the other meals, filled the discomfort of Catherine and Charlotte and the paranoid rantings of the increasingly unhinged Kenneth. The difference was that Colin MacLean was listening at the door, and he, unlike the servants, was not willing to take this sort of behaviour to a woman, to two women, without defending them. His blood boiled when her heard the way this man spoke. I know you're all plotting against me, but mark my words, ladies, I shall have my revenge. There was an awkward silence. Outside the room there was a bustling of the servants, and Colin took great care to avoid them. This man is a drunkard and a fool, observed Colin. He continued listening as he heard the voice of the young woman who had invaded his cave. But Sir Kenneth, said she, there is a cave out there that is the most beautiful thing I have seen on the island so far. It is large and could be a useful place in the event that things go poorly here. Kenneth guffawed. Charlotte, he laughed, you have an active imagination. This is a place I have made my own. There are traitors amongst us, to be sure, but no cave will be my home as long as I have my wits. I'm not sure that blackguard has his wits, mused Colin as he listened at the door. But I'll tell you one thing. If there is a fearsome animal living in that cave, I'll have my men find it and burn the damn thing out. For I want no animals threatening my women folk. You have an active imagination, to be sure. But we can kill any dangerous animals on this island. Men must have dominion over the animals, Sir Kenneth declared. Colin was alarmed when he heard this, confirming his suspicion that Kenneth was becoming aware that there were threats against him. Having heard this inane ranting for several minutes, he knew he had heard enough and decided to move off. Looking around, he noticed several servants moving with the stealth of burglars, and it seemed to him that these people, some of whom he recognised from his days as lord of this manor, were terribly nervous. Making an effort not to be seen and staying in the shadows, he moved furtively through the castle hallways to a place he remembered as a way out, far from prying eyes. Moving down a hallway near the southern end of the castle, he suddenly realised he was going the wrong way. He looked around, finding nowhere to hide just as he heard voices coming toward him. Without thinking, he ducked into the nearest doorway which was left ajar. Gingerly he closed it behind him, turned and looked around. He was in a bedroom, and by the looks of it, it was a woman's private quarters. This embarrassment shook Colin and he turned to leave just as he heard the voices coming closer. With nowhere to go, he looked around wildly to seek a place to hide himself until the trouble passed. The room consisted of a large feather bed, several dressers, a large wardrobe, and a dressing table. The stone walls utterly barren of pictures or other adornment, while drapes covered a small window. The drapes hung to the floor, which was a blessing, and so on hearing the voices stop in front of the door, he ducked behind the curtains. And it was just in the nick of time, too, for the door then opened and someone entered. The way he was standing, he was unable to ascertain who the person was, but from her breathing and the stealthy way she walked, he came to believe it was a woman. It was likely the woman the drunkard Campbell called Charlotte. She was now in her room, moving from place to place, looking at things. He tried his best to remain as silent as he could. He observed the young woman as she moved around the room. He noticed a pair of wire-rimmed spectacles sitting on her bedside table. I am such a fool, he heard the woman say. He wondered what she could be talking about. I go to all this trouble to transport a book all the way to the wilds of Scotland, 
and I lose it only days later. I am truly a fool. Now he knew what was going on. She was bemoaning the fact that she had lost her notebook, and he had it with him. This was his chance, he thought, to make her acquaintance. But how bizarre would it be for a man to appear from behind the curtains in a private residence of a young, unmarried woman? Although Colin had lived the life of a wild man in recent years, he was brought up in courts of great learning and politeness was second nature to him. Consequently, he was loath to embarrass the young woman, Charlotte. He stayed hidden. But then, Charlotte exclaimed, I really need to go back and find my notebook. How am I supposed to write about this if I keep losing the book? Colin had the notebook in his hand, and his need to help overcame his desire to remain hidden. He stepped out from behind the curtain and gently placed it on a bedside table. Charlotte turned as though she would see him, but, to Colin's surprise, she seemed not to see him. However, she did cry out as though she had seen a moose. What's going on in there? said Kenneth from the hallway. Open this door, I need to come in. I'll die before I let you into my bedchambers, she whispered as though to herself. She looked around furtively as though she sensed someone in the room. Maybe there are such things as selkies, she said to herself. And then she noticed the notebook on the nightstand. She reacted again with a gasp. What's going on in there? said a male voice outside the door. Charlotte looked panicked. I'm frightfully sorry, uncle, she called. I shall be quiet now. You'd best or I'll knock this door off its hinges. Charlotte turned away in disgust and picked up the notebook. Now how on earth did you get here? She asked the inanimate object. As she picked it up, a slip of paper fell to the floor. She leaned down to pick it up and Colin noticed as she held it strangely close to her eyes. Where are my spectacles? She said quietly. On the nightstand, she reached over to the glasses and put them on her nose. Then she read aloud the note that Colin had written. You have stumbled on the mystery of Lochboy, and if you are foolish enough to solve it, you are foolish enough to lose your life. Colin heard his words and was immediately struck by how inappropriate they were to this woman who seemed to be very kind and gentle. I've read her all wrong, he said to himself, watching her. Charlotte had a look of shock on her face, but she did not look afraid. She took off her glasses and looked up in wonder, as though she were participating in a fairy story. Magical, she said. I don't want to disturb whatever is there, but clearly there is something more intelligent than a bear living in it, and it is kind enough to return my notebook. She smiled and held the note to her breast. Chapter 7 Colin stepped gingerly out from the shadows. Without saying a word, he waited for her to notice him. Is there someone there? She said, reaching again for her spectacles. I'm here in the hallway, and if you don't be quiet, I'll bash in this door. I'm terribly sorry, Uncle. I shall be quiet now. Dinner be afeared, said Colin softly, as it became clear that she had seen him. I was the one to return your notebook. Charlotte looked as though she was grateful, and so he handed her the book, but for some reason, inexplicably, she gasped. Please be quiet. I mean you no harm, he said. Charlotte turned to Colin, a smile playing on her lips. I think you owe me an explanation. Aye, that's the trouth, he said, smiling. Charlotte, for her part, was not only taken aback by the presence of this intruder in her chambers, but she could also not stop looking at his powerful bare chest. She smiled as she looked at him. Her raised eyebrows gave away her desire. My name is Colin MacLean. I am the rightful laird of this castle. I am the man you have seen around these parts of late. And when you were writing in the cave, up on the rocks of the shore, it was I as well. I beg your forgiveness for this intrusion. Charlotte said nothing. She simply nodded. Colin felt he needed to reassure her more. I mean you no harm, lassie. I mean only to live my life here. Emboldened, Charlotte looked at him, standing before her, naked but for his short trues that covered his embarrassment. I must say, she said timidly, you are a fine specimen of a man. 
Thank you, lassie. And you are a fine specimen of a woman. Charlotte blushed. Thank you. I have sworn loyalty to an independent Scotland, and this Kenneth Campbell is not the rightful laird of this castle. He is a usurper. He is my uncle. So I see. And as such I owe him my livelihood. Aye, I see that as well, he said. But I must beg a boon of ye, lassie. He looked hesitant. He raised his eyebrows, and Charlotte took a seat on the bed, gazing in wonderment at the beauty of his physique. It's Charlotte, is it not? Yes, Charlotte Browning, daughter of the Earl of Tremaine in Yorkshire. Catherine Campbell, Kenneth's wife, is my aunt. I understand, he said, but I must depart. So soon, she said, feeling brazen and excited. Colin was confused. He looked into her deep brown eyes and it was as though he had seen into her soul. You are bonny, sure as I look at ye, he said, smiling. Thank you, kind sir, she responded. And if I may be so bold, you are very handsome yourself. So will you help me then, lassie? Well, she said, striking fear into Colin. She hesitated. What exactly is it you need my help doing? Surviving, he said flatly. I have my sister and a wee lad to protect, as well as my country, and as you know, this miscreant Campbell is sworn to destroy me and my country, and all my countrymen. I know very little about politics, Sir Colin, said Charlotte, and to be honest, I have little or no loyalty to him. As you no doubt know, he is a frightful fellow, a drunkard, and a lout. Aye, I do know of that, said Colin, and I am obliged to you for siding with me. Now that I've done what I came to do, would you be kind enough to show me a way out? Well, certainly, said Charlotte, but I fear he is still stalking the halls. Perhaps it is better for us to get to know one another for a wee bit. Colin smiled. I'm hardly dressed for the occasion, he said, embarrassed. Believe me, Sir Colin, I have no objection to your dress. Nay, there's a boon, but I'm a wee bit chilly. Of course, said Charlotte handing him a woollen blanket. Please cover yourself with this. Thank you, miss. He put the blanket around his massive shoulders, and Charlotte patted the bed beside her. Come sit thee doon, she said in imitation of the mode of speech she had observed from Myrie. He sat beside her, smiling. Now, Colin, if I may call you that, she said. I am, as you no doubt know, a confirmed old maid and so the normal rules of propriety do not apply to me. Colin laughed, covering his mouth, and Charlotte noted that his beautiful white teeth were perfect, contrasted to his ruby red lips, surrounded by his tawny red beard, giving him a most magisterial look. I hardly think you qualify as an old maid, he said. You must know you're beautiful, in my eyes anyway. You're very kind, but I'm afraid there is no need to flatter me. I have been told by all the right people that should know that I am no longer eligible to marry because of my advanced age. But you canna be more than one and twenty, he protested. I am afraid you are mistaken, for I am four and twenty and will be five and twenty come winter, and thus I am no longer on the market, as they say. Well, I think you're bonny, my lass, he said, although in truth I've only just lost my Wi-Fi. Oh, exclaimed Charlotte, you were married? I, I was. My wifey was killed in this very dune, he said. She died protecting it from a marauding band of Sassanac soldiers. That is frightful. She must have been very brave. Aye, she was at that. My morag was a wildcat. She slew twa of their number before she was run through by a third coward. That is simply frightful, she responded. I can see how that would be heartbreaking. Aye, it was, but I have had no time to mourn. For the moment I returned to find her slain, I was forced into hiding, and I've been living in that kaif yonder where you stopped to write your lovely writing. You read my work? she asked, surprised. I hope it were nay in position, he said apologetically. No, of course not. It's only that his was frightfully poorly written. On the contrary, I found it very insightful and beauteous, he said, turning to look at her with great intensity. This look made Charlotte blush as she realised she had been looking at his powerful chest under the blanket. 
You are too kind, she said. Lassie, I dinna gee compliments willy-nilly. I mean what I say. You have a gifty. Thank you, Colin. She moved closer to him, feeling a kinship with his wild Celtic speech. Something drew her to him. She didn't know what exactly it was, but she felt herself drawn to him. She put her hand on his shoulder. He smiled. Thou feels right lovely, he said, looking at her and placing his hand on her shoulder as he turned to her. You know, Charlotte, I haven't felt a woman's touch in many months, and I didn't ken how much I missed it until now. I too have not felt the touch of a kindly friend in many months either, she said. I cannot explain why, but I feel a great kinship with you. But I confess I do, and I do hope we can be good friends. I ban you this, Miss Charlotte. I can be a real friend if you want. That would be a wonderful thing, she said. Of course I am well aware that there can be no more than friendship between us. Why do you say sick a thing? said Colin, taking her hand in his. I find you right, Bonnie. You must ken. I would fain kiss ye, in fact, Miss Charlotte, if I didn't know you're likely sworn to your celibacy. Charlotte bristled at this suggestion. I am certainly not saying this out of any sort of oath. It is merely convention that dictates my lot in life. Ah, Miss Charlotte, I canna tell you how to conduct your life, but here in Scotland things have been well torn asunder in terms of the rules of propriety. For I married when I needed Tay, to a bonny lass, from a good and faithful clan, but she was killed in a barbaric manner, dashing my hopes of any future happiness. Only tonight, as I get to know you better, have I revived my thoughts of happiness and married serenity. I confess, Colin, that I too have entertained these wild thoughts, and we must admit that this madness is the result of the straitened circumstances in which we find ourselves. But I am interested to know more about your situation. How, for example, did you end up living in a cave? We were driven out by the Sassanac, he said, driven out like animals to live off the land. Twas your uncle, that Campbell clansman, who drove us out. That is not right, she said adamantly. This is simply unacceptable. Tis, but what can I do? for I am without men-at-arms and without kinsmen. As it is, my sister Flora and her wee bairn Angus are a I have the world. Charlotte was a woman of vast empathy, and she was seized with a great sense of indignation, which turned itself into strong desire at that moment. Without warning to him, she moved on him and kissed him. Rather than move away, he pulled her to him and kissed her back. As he touched her lips, she melted into him, her heart beating wildly, and her face flushed with desire. Oh, Colin, she gasped, I do not know what to say, for I am woefully inexperienced in the art of love. Charlotte, ye are filling me with desire, and so there is no manner in which you are inexperienced. You are listening to your heart, as am I, and it will guide us. Then kiss me again, Colin, for I want to feel your lips on mine. And he pulled her close and felt her heart beating wildly as he pressed his strong chest to her thin frame. Although she was a very thin young woman, she was beautiful in her own peculiar way, and it was very alluring to Colin, just as his powerful frame was greatly alluring to her. Something about the contrast between their bodies made the desire increase. Colin moved on to Charlotte like a man possessed, and she surrendered to his strength and power but there was a delicacy to his touch that she had never imagined would exist in a man so virile, so wild, and as his long red hair twined around her shoulders, she gasped. Oh, Colin, this is madness. Aye, Charlotte, tis, but it is the loveliest madness, is it no? Yes, it is, she said, and she leaned into him, pushing him down onto the bed. I have never known a man in all my life, but it seems elementary to me. Your body is like a map telling me every nuance and every detail, and I love every last piece of it. There was a bang on her door. I say, Charlotte, are you still awake? Oh yes, Uncle Kenneth, she called. I am just reading. Well, blow that candle out. I'm not about to spend my inheritance on candles for you to read about lovers and madmen. Yes, Uncle. 
Colin had risen and stood before her, burning with desire as she blew out the candle. Fortunately, the moon was high in the sky by this time, and the light that spilled in through the casement window gave him an ethereal glow. I'm afraid of being discovered, she said to Colin in a whisper. Let us meet again tomorrow at the cave. I believe I know how to find it again. Very well. And in the meantime, I shall climb down the parapet through the casement window, by your leave. Yes, for it is only a few yards to the ground. Do tell me you'll meet me tomorrow. I wouldn't miss it for the world, lassie, he said with great feeling, turning on his heel, tossing the blanket to her and leaping to the casement, opening it and leaping out. Charlotte rushed to the window to ensure that he landed safely and watched him as he made his way to the cellar. Moments later, he emerged, dressed in his tam, his kilt, his sporran and his plaid. He looked magnificent, like something from a fairy story, and Charlotte, her mind still addled by the emotion of the night, the unexpected joy of finding love in a wildly inappropriate place, saw him as the most desirable man in the world. She stayed at her window as he strode across the heath, his powerful strides covering the ground swiftly as though he were pursuing a deer. His kilt swung jauntily, and just as he was at the crest of the horizon he turned, bowed to her, and blew her a kiss. I must be mad, she said to herself. This creature is more beast than man, and yet he holds my heart as none has ever done. I have written about him in my notebook, but none of my words could have captured the joy of knowing him in the way I do. And then he disappeared over the horizon. Chapter 8 You dinner ken, Flora, said Colin, as he sat inside the cave late that evening. This Sassanac woman is nothing like what we've been told to believe. Things are much different from what we had thought. This man, this Campbell, is a brute and a drunkard. I know well that Charlotte, for that is her name, would help us should we want to take the dune back. You've always been a fool when it comes to lassies, Colin, said Flora. These people killed your Morag and they killed my husband and all of my kin. I can a risk that you are wrong, my brother. I'm sorry, but we must fight them, uh. Colin knew that much of what Flora was saying was true. They have both suffered greatly at the hands of the English, and he knew too that he was a soft touch when it came to beautiful women. Charlotte was lovely and intelligent, and his time with her that evening reminded him of what it was like to enjoy the company of a woman. Remember the forty-five, said Flora with passion. There is nay way this woman can know what we have lived and suffered through. We can use her, though, to get what we want. And I want nay mare than my ancestral haim. How did you find the place? I'll be honest, Flora. It is in very guide shape. They've taken guide care of it all. And I spied Mary still there. Ah, Mary, toiling for the Sassanac. That is a stab in my heart, said Flora with venom. For Mary was one of her kinswomen, and the idea that she had to work for the hated English was a greatly painful thought. They killed her kin as much as they killed mine, and now she is a servant in their household. It's just too much to bear. It was shortly after the return of the defeated soldiers coming back from the Battle of Culloden. All Scotland was in turmoil, trying to return their individual homes to normal. Duncan Macfarlane, Flora's husband, had returned with Colin, and while Colin tried his best to make sure the place stayed out of English hands, and he had good reason to think this, given that he was out on the islands, and the English seemed to have confined their vengeance to the mainland, Duncan was still trying to organise a band of loyalists to take the mainland back from the English. He woke up one morning with the goal of travelling to the islands and rousing the Scots who lived there to a warlike pitch. He had started this by travelling to Iona, and when he had met with the demoralised men who lived there, he had managed to inspire them to promise twenty men. Twenty strong men is a start, he said to Colin. Aye, tis, but we'll need twenty thousand. The English had mare across the highlands, and by ma scouts they've started moving our people out. They've been burning the crofts of the loyalists, and even those who had nothing to do with the battle have been forced off their lands. It is a terrible thing we're living through. Aye, and I agree, Colin. It is more than a proud man can bear. 
I'll go to rouse mere men too as soon as I can. Do you not think it wiser to secure our homeland here on Mull? asked Colin. You saw what I saw at Culloden Moor, my Billy, said Duncan. They have nay decency. They will slay us only for the land, and they'll move us to Ireland or the colonies. I know, it's dire, he said, but what is the best way to fight them? It's to rouse the Highlanders and the Islanders to the truth of what they want, for it will be the end of the race as we know it if we capitulate to them. I am off to Sky tomorrow. I'll have fifty men there, I'm bound, and I shall be after any proud Scotsman who'll swing a claymore. You're a good and passionate man, my Billy Duncan, said Colin. I hope you succeed, for it is a terrible thing they are doing to us here. Aye, it is, said Duncan. At that moment, Flora came in with Angus. You'll be leaving us again. I'm starting to think it's my cookery. Duncan laughed. Nay, my love, your cookery is just fine. I'll be honest with you, though, Flora. We're in a terrible time. We have to fight now or ne'er. Tis the least we can do or die. I'll have nay talk of death in this house, and we are wee bairn too, said Flora. Duncan looked at Angus. He was young, but he was clearly paying attention. Do you know what's happening here, young Angus? I'll tell you this, he said with passion. I didn't want to serve the English, for they're a scurvy lot from what I hear. Duncan laughed. My boy, you give me hope for the future. He turned to Flora. I was just telling your Billy here that I've roused twenty men from Iona, and I'm off for Sky tomorrow at first light. We'll have a band of seventy by the end of the week. Aye, that is guide news, my love, said Flora, kissing him. You're the brave man I always wanted to be. Now come to sleep with me and I'll send you on your way in the morning. Colin watched as the three of them went off, filled with hope for the future. Tis something to see, he said, the indefatigable Scotsman. He smiled, thinking maybe this situation was not unendurable. And by week's end, Duncan had secured seventy fighting men to form the beginning of their army. But things were not to be safe, for the word came to a Campbell who reported this news of an uprising to the English. Duncan was killed in an unfair fight that evening when the English came for them. Colin remembered this moment and he knew for certain that Flora was right. The English could not be trusted. He wondered what had come over him. This bonny English lass has bewitched me, he thought to himself. But I canna guy into these feelings. I must remember my lovely Morag and my faithful Duncan, and never forget that they didna die in vain. Chapter 9 The next morning Kenneth Campbell, the new thane of the Kinlochby Castle, woke up early, for him early was nine in the morning, and rode forth into the lands to discover more about these mysteries that had been swirling about in the whispers of the servants. I'll brook no opposition, he said to his wife Catherine. This whisper campaign must come to an end. I understand, Kenneth, she said. I don't want to live in fear for our lives. And he rode out that morning, alone and without armour. For he was the Lord, and it was his domain, he told himself. It was a beautiful morning on the Isle of Mull, and the soft breeze coming off the sea was refreshing to even the stone heart of Kenneth Campbell. All of a sudden, he heard a whistling rush by his ear. He turned to where it was coming from and saw an arrow coming at him. He bent down in his saddle as an arrow shot by him, filling him with an initial fear that was soon replaced with a deep and abiding anger. How dare they, he said to himself, for this is an attempt on my life and then he remembered the wild stories of Charlotte and her selkies. I must be going mad, he laughed. Arrows flying in mull. Ha! He rode on again with a chuckle. Maybe I just need a wee dram, he said, cursing his tendency to use Scots when he was relaxed. He fetched the flask from his hip and unscrewed the cap. He took a long drink of the life-giving elixir and smiled. That's a good drink, he laughed feeling its warming effect almost immediately. Ah, the Scottish make a capital drink to warm the cockles of my heart, he said, as he felt another arrow pierce his arm. 
At first he was unsure what had happened, as the calm of the drunkard had given him a delayed sense of what was happening. But the pain of the prick in his shoulder was acute, and suddenly he was falling backward, his arm in terrible pain. The arrow had only grazed him, though, and had not even stayed in his arm. He looked about for the source of this missile, but seeing nothing, his superstitious mind was overcome with feelings that the spirits of the dead clansmen were taunting him and tormenting him like the demons of his sleep. He fell forward, nearly fainting from the pain, and his horse, sensing that something was wrong, galloped across the moor, returning to the castle. As he returned, lying prostrate on the back of the horse, his groom ran out from the barn and grabbed the bridle. My lord, you're hurt, he said. Kenneth took his whip and tried to whip the poor groom with it, but his weakness made it fall pointlessly on his shoulder. Kenneth was not a brave man, and this cut he had incurred scared him. He was terrified of being killed, and felt more and more that his own servants were plotting against him. Get away from me, you filthy Highlander, said Kenneth, although he had never taken the time to know his groom, Alex Ferguson, who was a skilful man with horses and an excellent servant despite the way he had been treated by Kenneth. My laird, said Alex, let me tend to your wound at the very least. You get away from me, you cur, or you'll feel the sting of my lash, said Kenneth, although he was beginning to lose consciousness from the sight of the blood, which was flowing fairly liberally from his wound just shy of his shoulder. Yes, my laird, said Alex, as he caught the fainting Kenneth. He put him on the ground and stabled the horse carefully before coming back to deal with Kenneth. Several of the servants had seen what had happened and were running to fetch Kenneth and take him inside. Fetch bandages, said Mary as she helped Alex take Kenneth to a room where he was able to lay down. Several of the other maids ran to get bandages, although truth be told not a one of them was sorry to see him wounded. They dressed the wound and he was himself again by lunchtime. Charlotte and Catherine sat while he went on and won about the ungrateful Scots and how they didn't know a great leader when they saw one. You know, Charlotte, he said conspiratorially, I think your selkie might be a turncoat as I first suspected. I shall send word to the mainland to have some good stout English soldiers to help me garrison this fort, for that is what it is. It is no longer a pleasant castle. Now, we must fortify the walls and bring firepower to secure it. Are you sure it was not simply a poor huntsman whose arrow went astray? asked Catherine. She was fortunate that she was sitting distant from him, for he threw his pewter goblet in her direction, spilling its contents across the table and forcing her to duck to avoid the missile. She said nothing but knew at that moment that there was no hope for Kenneth. He had become the thing she dreaded the most, a drinker and a lost cause. Chapter 10 Kenneth raged through the day and into the night. He had sent off numerous letters to the garrisons stationed at Oban, demanding they send troops to him as an insurrection had been started. His messengers were his servants, and so there were several people missing from the household, and many of the usual duties had been neglected because of the absence of these people. Why can nothing be done in the way I like? he demanded of Mary, who was the only person available to do anything since the messengers were on the mainland. Sir, she said helplessly, I am doing what I can to make things work, but we are short a large number of staff. Please understand that I cannot be everywhere at once. Kenneth looked at her with loathing. I don't like your tone, wench, he said, and backhanded her across the face, making her shriek with surprise. Truthfully, she had been expecting him to hit her all day, but she had let down her guard, and so it was not the pain but the surprise that made her cry out. I'll brook no opposition, he said. If you cannot do what I ask when I ask, you will have to bear the result of my displeasure. Yes, sir, said Mary, thinking to herself that this was another affront that needed redress. She was shining his boots when he came by and demanded them. I need those boots, right now he hollered. But, sir, they are only half shown, said Myrie. Your man is a wah, and I cannot do it the way you like. You cannot do anything the way I like, you filthy slut, he said, snatching the boots from her hands. Now get out of my way. 
I am going to find out who these thieves are that threaten the Lord of the Isles. You're no Malaird of the Isles, she whispered. What did you say? he bellowed. I said yes, Lord of the Isles, she said. He looked ready to shout, but when he heard what she had said, he nodded. Fine, he said, the boots still unfastened, but on his feet, the tongues flapping out before him. He looked foolish, but Mary knew better than to point this out. He was outside and saddling his horse in a flash, and Mary saw him through the window, raging and shouting at the wind. His madness, his cruelty, and his stupidity were on full display that day. It was hours of raging on the heath, and when he was spent, he returned to get another bottle of the Scotch whisky he so enjoyed. I'll have my men before the day is out, he said, as he drunkenly sprawled himself out at the dinner table. Then he noticed that he was alone. Where is my wife and my niece? he shrieked. Charlotte was out, walking by the sea, hoping to run into her Colin and let him know that someone took a shot at her Uncle Kenneth and warn him that he was bent on revenge. Although she sort of knew that it had been done on purpose and intentionally to drag his horrifying behaviour into the light of day and expose him for the terrible usurper he was. As she was walking on the strand, she heard a whisper. She turned to see Colin at the mouth of the cave, dressed in his tartan kilt and plaid. He held his finger before his face as she looked at him, smiling with joy at the sight of him. She ran to him and embraced him. I'm very glad to see ye as well, he said, but things are dangerous today. That is what I'm here to tell you as well, said Charlotte. Someone tried to shoot my Uncle Kenneth with an arrow, and he is raging. He has sent for soldiers to come and help him secure the land. Guide, said Colin. The grouse is flushed. Now we'll see what sort of metal he's made of. You mean you did this on purpose? Aye, said Colin. Tis the only way to expose a fraud like Kenneth Campbell. He doesn't have allies on the islands, and likely none in the highlands when folk know what sort of a bastard he is. Charlotte was unused to hearing this kind of talk and blushed when she heard this. It is true that he is a frightful bully, threatening poor Mary all the time. That makes me blood boil, said Colin. You know she is kin to me. She was once a woman of high degree but her riches were taken illegitimately by that Campbell bugger. He's a coarse one, he is, and treating her like a servant. Worse than a servant. He is forever calling her a slut and a wench, said Charlotte. I didn't know she was high-born, and still I felt it was an affront, but knowing she is a lady makes it all the worse. And Kenneth knows this. Surely. He had met her on many occasions afore the Campbells had completely discredited themselves. "'Tis a grotesque thing he's doing, and now for the pleasure of laying those who once were greater than him low. "'I understand. I must go away. I am needed for dinner,' said Charlotte. "'And my uncle notices if I miss a meal. "'Aye. "'Tis nigh guid reason tie a ruse suspicion,' said Colin. "'But know that he has sent several requests for reinforcements to Oban. "'No doubt he has asked for more whisky too,' said Colin, laughing. "'I fear no soldier.' I know you are brave, but please remain as safe as you can, and no more arrows. You'll ne'er believe me, Charlotte, he said, bringing her close to him and embracing her. But this were no more doing. I fear it is the ire of my sister-in-law that had done this. I dinna ken for sure, but I suspect it is her doing. I've never known a woman who was warlike, said Charlotte, smiling with joy. I had no idea there were women like this. All my kith are warlike said Colin. A reunion is like reliving the wars, the women folk and men alike. I tell you, it is nay joy to be related to a war like Athena like her. But it is exciting, and something I've never known in all my life. Well, my love, if you were to be married to me, you would know ne peace at her. That would be the most wonderful thing I can imagine, said Charlotte. Dear God in heaven, Charlotte Browning, but you are the woman of me dreams, he said kissing her deeply and hugging her to his massive chest, filling her heart with joy and passion. I must go now, Colin, she said, smiling broadly. I cannot wait to see ye again. Colin laughed to hear her try her brogue. Nor can I, Miss Browning. Nor can I. She rushed back to be in time for the luncheon that was to be prepared at noon, 
but by the time she had reached the castle, the sounds of yelling and crashing was already emanating from the dining hall. She hurried to make her way there, and as she opened the door to the dining room, she saw a pewter goblet crash to the floor as Kenneth began to yell. I'll not have that fool wandering around the heath. Does she not know it is dangerous? I know it and I have returned, said Charlotte, for I heard about your mishap this morning. Then why in the name of the devil are you out gallivanting now? Surely you know we are in a state of siege. I knew you were, uncle, but I didn't know we were all in danger. Well, if I am, then we all are. So stay close to your quarters until the reinforcements arrive. Reinforcements? Yes. I've requested twenty men, strong and true, he said as though his words would be heeded by the English forces. I see, said Charlotte. She was worried, of course, and wondering if indeed these reinforcements wouldn't create more trouble than they would solve. For her experience of soldiers was that they tended to create pandemonium wherever they were sent. You doubt me, but I can tell you this. These thieves and rustlers, they'll be flushed out and ruined. We'll have a bloodbath if I have anything to do with it, said Kenneth, laughing heartily. Chapter 11 Charlotte returned to her room and wrote about the day's events in her notebook. She had a way of turning the mundane into the exciting events that she later would recall. But she was also worried for Colin, whom she had begun to think of as her partner in this adventure. While she never tired of describing his proud shoulders, his well-shaped leg, or his fiery red hair, she also found herself using many of the words she rarely used to describe Sir Kenneth Campbell. Although from the first she had taken a dislike to him, where it was at first simply because of his bad manners and his drinking, now it was because he was a usurper and a thief. She had worked up a storyline in which Kenneth's colluding with the English invaders would be punished in a very creative way. All through the afternoon, she thought about Colin, and how devoted he was to his nephew and his sister, and how loving he was to her. Somehow this Englishwoman found herself relating to the Scots more than the English. As a writer, she was more attracted to the underdog, she knew, but she was also attracted to the one with the right on their side, and she knew that Colin was a true hero, while Kenneth had all the qualities of a turncoat and a coward. Of course, she was terrified that twenty heavily armed men would be terrifying the local crofters and servants and bear down upon the cave where the Maclean's were living, biding their time. I'm convinced these thieves are out on the land, said Sir Kenneth. I've had my men out all day scouring the countryside. They burned two of the farmhouses of these filthy Scots. They are a disgusting bunch, I must say. Are you not Scottish, Sir Kenneth? said Charlotte. I ask only because it is peculiar that you are speaking ill of your own people. What business is it of yours, you slut? he yelled. And for the first time, Catherine bristled. Kenneth, she said in a harsh tone, you will not speak to my niece like that. She is a guest in our house, and she will be treated with respect. Perhaps she does not understand the political situation in Scotland at the moment, but you may not call her a slut. If you are insisting I treat her like a guest, then I will rescind my offer of hospitality. Charlotte, you may leave at any time if you are not happy here. What? she said, as she was not really paying attention but thinking about Colin. I said, if you are not happy, you are welcome to leave. Who said I was not happy here? Your aunt did. I certainly did not, Kenneth. I merely asked you to treat her as the guest she is and not to upbraid her with insults. I'll not be spoken to like this. Get out of my sight, the both of ye. At that, Catherine rose and went to Charlotte. Come with me, my dear, as your uncle is not behaving like a civilised man. We can go and sit in the sitting room away from this sort of behaviour. It cannot be good for you. Thank you, Aunt Catherine, said Charlotte, rising and looking angrily at Kenneth. I must say, I do not know how to respond to a man who calls me a slut. It is a unique experience for me. Ach, it may be the first time, but it'll not be the last, you filthy gutter snipe, he raged as they left the room and went to sit in the sitting room. Several hours later, there was a commotion in the drawing room. Charlotte went out into the hallway to hear what could have happened. She heard the sound of voices, 
but she could not understand the exact words. What in the bloody hell am I supposed to do with these blackguards? Sir Kenneth was saying. She heard another voice, much softer and quieter. My lord, there is a great need for soldiers in the mainland, and the islands are largely considered to be appeased. The commanding officer in Oban has provided you with these Servian mercenaries. Of course, you'll need to pay them, but they are a bloodthirsty group, and if you need someone routed, they will rout them. They bloody well had better, said Sir Kenneth. They are mercenaries, eh? Servian? Where on earth is Servia? Have you not heard tell of the Stradiots? They are the finest murderers in the world. They fought in nearly every war in Europe in the last two hundred years, and most times they have been conquerors. But they do it strictly for money, and you'll need to pay an interpreter. Like hell I do, said Kenneth, drunkenly slurring his words. Sir, if you do not, you will not be able to communicate your needs to these men, for they speak not a word of English. Get out of my home, said Kenneth to this soft-spoken man. Well, my good man, said this soft-spoken man, I have warned you, you have no control over them. Get out, he shouted. I cannot stand this constant need for money. Get out of my house or I'll put the hounds on you. There was a commotion in the drawing room, followed by a slamming of doors, and then a strange silence. Charlotte looked out the window, and the soft-spoken man, with a small and bookish-looking man, were running across the front of the house and into the stable. Moments later, he charged out of the stable on horseback and made for the road. The bookish man followed more slowly, looking somewhat confused. Kenneth, who had flown into a rage and thrown this man out because he suspected he was being bilked for money, and his fortune was not as fluid as he would have liked it to be. But in the absence of the interpreter, he found himself face to face with twelve huge and angry-looking stradiots, mercenaries from Servia, who served for the money and the joy of killing, or so their legends told. Stajelis do Radimo, said the first, and it seemed the leader of this band. What are you saying? yelled Sir Kenneth, and this man drew his sword and put it to Kenneth's neck. Zatvorish usta ili chuti prerezati grklian, he said softly straight into Kenneth's face. Now listen, boy, said Kenneth, trying to diffuse the situation and understanding nothing. I merely need to show you the villains that we need to rout. Follow me. He made his way to the door, but the Servians made no move to follow him. They had unsheathed their swords and stood, legs akimbo, looking at Sir Kenneth as though he were the person they wanted to kill. Kenneth turned and tried his best to appease them. He was not a leader by nature, and he had no real way to communicate with them, once the interpreter had left, and so he began to draw a series of pictures, hoping some of this would make sense to them. At first they laughed and looked at his childish pictures, but within a few minutes it seemed to be clear what they needed to do. Treba da ubijemo pečinskog čoveka. I don't know what you Servians are talking about, but I like the way you are quick with your swords. Come with me and we'll make a day of revenge he said. Chapter 12 Upon hearing the departure of these madmen, Charlotte looked out the window and noticed that they were headed westward and away from the cave. She put on a shawl and hurried to the cave where Colin and his family lived. She ran as quickly as her slight frame would allow, her hair flying wildly in the light breeze. It must be said that she looked very beautiful like this and her face has regained much of the colour she had lost because of her illness, largely because of the return of the possibility of love. She moved quickly and lightly down the path, looking mostly for the evidence of the mercenaries who could be anywhere. She was therefore unprepared for the arrow that shot her way, narrowly missing her. But when she noticed that the arrow was clearly meant for her, she was shocked, and it made her wonder if she was siding with the wrong side. She looked around for the person who had shot it at her, and saw no one, but she looked at the tree root that had been the unfortunate victim of the arrow's trajectory, and realised it probably came from high in the trees. She was uncertain who had shot it at her, but equally uninterested in finding out in case they had another that was more carefully aimed at her. When she finally arrived at the cave, she called out, Hello? Is there anyone in there? It's me, Charlotte. Colin poked his head out after a moment, and noticing she was alone, 
beckoned for her to approach. Come in, he said. There are soldiers afoot. I know. That is what I came to tell you about, for I have seen them. I'm no afeard of English soldiers, said Colin proudly. But they are not English. They are, in fact, Stradiots. They fight for money. They are mercenaries from Servia. He nodded his head slowly as though he were in the know. Ah, see, he said. So that's the way he wants to fight, is it? He has gallowglass. Gallowglass, asked Charlotte. What is that? That is the wired we use for the Fierties and Kurs who dare to battle for another man's homeland in exchange for money. There is very little more footy in our culture than a gallowglass. Well, these men looked very bloodthirsty, I must say, said Charlotte. But let me show you a rune, my dearie, now that you are here, said Colin, embracing her tenderly. Of course, lead the way, she responded. He led her through the entrance at the back of the cave, and she was amazed at the comfort that had been hewn from the rock. There were comfortable chairs and feather beds, fit for a king. Well, tis fit for a prince who will one day be king, said Colin. It is beautiful, beyond my wildest imagination, said Charlotte turning to Colin who took her in his arms and embraced her, lowering her onto the bed. Would you be Madoxy? he asked. You're what? asked Charlotte, confused. My sweetie, my lover. He looked perplexed, as though language had failed him. Colin, I am yours now and forever, she responded, kissing his powerful mouth with her tender cherry lips. The sensation of passion rushing through his body was alien to him, and remembering this feeling brought a rush of emotions that brought tears to his eyes. He gasped. What is wrong? asked Charlotte, concerned. It is just too bonny, he said. I am more taken with you than we any lass I've ever met, he said, taking her glasses off her nose as he kissed her deeply and looked into her eyes. Charlotte smiled at him, seeing him up close for the first time, and feeling his powerful manly body so close and so tender. I never dreamt I would love again in my lifetime, said Colin, and I never dreamt I would ever feel the touch of a man who loved me. She paused. He smiled. Don't fret, Charlotte, he said. You have nay spoken out a turn, for I do love ye, with all my hurt. Oh, thank God, she said. I was terrified I was making a fool of myself. Never, he said, and you know I want to feel your touch for a long time. It is so much joy to feel the touch of a tender lass and one who is so broad, original and stunning. You are too kind, Colin, she said. Then she pulled him on top of her, and as he gently moved her legs apart on the soft feathered bed, he ensured that she and he could both embrace with the passion that was necessary for each of them to maintain their pride, and yet also allow them to express the yearning that was pent up in each of them for different reasons. Charlotte had been told how undesirable she was for so long, that having a man desire her was not only pleasant, it was somehow otherworldly, made more bizarre by the cave surroundings and the strange decor in that beautiful cave. And for Colin, who had given up on love when the love of his life died and felt the door close on that aspect of his soul, giving himself entirely to family and to avenging their deaths, this moment of ecstasy was beyond his wildest imaginings. They spent the better part of the afternoon discovering the geography of each other's body, the joys and the challenges of their sadness. Colin grew to learn about the beauty that was trapped behind the glasses that were the symbol to Charlotte that she was beyond desire and old and unwanted. He wanted her deeply and cared for every beauty mark on her body. He loved the tenderness she displayed to him, the vulnerability that was quite strange to his culture where every man, woman and child had to be tough and brave without an inkling of vulnerability. She was amazed at his intelligence and sensitivity because she had been taught that the Scots were a brutish race, and yet his tenderness and intelligence, his understanding of the nuances of the need for Scottish independence and the desire of the English to subdue them. I have only a desire to subdue you, my love, said Charlotte. Notwithstanding the many needs of these people, I want only for you to give in to me. And it was at this moment that their peace was disturbed. I hear someone without, 
said Charlotte. "'Tis Flora,' said Colin, sitting bolt upright. "'It that bad?' asked Charlotte. "'I dinna ken,' said Colin. And at that very moment Flora entered, altering the mood of the whole cave. She walked in, stopped, stared, and said not a word. "'Hello, Flora,' said Colin. "'What in heaven's name is she doing in our hame?' she said with venom. Charlotte came here to warn me of the gallow glass that is coming after us. Gallow glass? Flora said. These Sassanaks are all much. They can a fight, so they pay others to battle. It is despicable. Aye, that it is, but tis a danger we must be aware of. We must neutralise them. I ham a quiver and a raise. Suddenly Charlotte became aware of the young man standing there silently, looking very worried. This must be Angus, she said stepping forward and shaking his hand. Flora stepped forward. You stay awa from a bairn, she snapped. I only... I dinna care what you mean. Thy is my bairn, and my any one. Nobody, especially no Sassanach woman, will coom betwixt us. She pulled out an arrow and stepped back as she put it in her bow, and raised it to Charlotte, who stood her ground, partly out of shock, and partly out of pride and bravery. Colin stepped forward. Stop that right now, said Colin. We need of the freens we can get. Flora slowly lowered the bow and arrow. Very well, she said with a scowl, but dinna touch the wee bairn. I shan't, said Charlotte, but may I ask if it was you who shot at me this afternoon? Aye, twas, and it was I who shot your master and ah, she said defiantly. Well, he is not my master. He is my uncle by marriage and a thorough reprobate. In fact, although you only grazed him, I think it would be better for the world had you shot him through the heart. I'm glad to hear you say that, said Flora, for I aim to do juice that. And as Charlotte began to relax, she turned away, and without her noticing, Flora put the arrow to the string of her bow and aimed directly at her heart. Colin, noticing this, leapt at Flora, and the arrow went wild, piercing the side of the cave. Charlotte looked and saw Colin holding the bow, and in shock she ran for the cave door, convinced in that moment that she had been betrayed by the man who had shown her so much love in the afternoon. She ran as fast as she could for the castle, in total confusion and blind with sadness. Why would he do that? Does he think I can be bought with a few caresses? She thought to herself. Why does any man touch me? It is to get something from me, but to try to kill me. It is too much. She was plunged into the depths of despair. Chapter 13 Now listen up, men, said Sir Kenneth to the mercenaries. We have trouble here on the island. There is a group of Scotsmen who are threatening our sovereign territory, and it is your task to rout the bastards. There was a blank look on each of their warlike faces. Alex, his stable man, was standing beside him. Sir Kenneth looked at Alex. Can you make any sense of this? These blackguards cannot understand a word I say. I canna say, Sir Kenneth, said a confused Alex. I'd say we need an interpreter. You damnable fool, he replied with venom. Of course we do. But where am I to find someone who speaks Servian? The wee bookish fellow was a translator, was he no? I care nothing for that. Now you listen here, Alex. You get these bloody Servians to understand that I need these thieves routed and strung up on poles outside my castle, or you'll be hanging there by day's end. And with that, he strode out of the room in a fury. Alex looked at the Servians and smiled weakly. Dakli, Mali Shkote, Stadaradimo, said the Servian who seemed to be the leader. He was a tall and broad-shouldered man with long, greasy black hair that fell over his massive brow, obscuring his tiny, beady eyes. His huge beard obscured the rest of his face, giving him a look like someone from a prehistoric time. Alex looked at him, trying to understand what he said. He shook his head. You, he said, pointing at them as a group. Kill, he said, taking a sword and putting it to his throat. The Servians nodded, concentrating on his actions. Cosmo mi da ubihemo, said one of them, a blond giant with a pleasant grin on his face. 
Man in cave, said Alex, indicating a hole in a rock. At that moment, Charlotte entered the large room and all the Servian men looked at her in something that resembled shock. Good morning, Alex, said Charlotte. What is the meaning of this? My lady, said a hapless Alex, I am tasked with speaking to these men and I dinna speak their tongue. What language do they speak? she asked. I believe it is called Servian, he said. And where do they come from? They are mercenaries, bought and paid for by the English. They came with a translator, but your uncle, in his wisdom, sent him away. Charlotte looked at them. Est-ce que vous parlez français? she asked in French. Do you speak French? Oui, madame, said the one with the massive beard and the beady eyes. Je parle français. My uncle, the man who hired you, wants you to find a thief who is hiding in a cave. He thinks he is in a cave by the forest, she said in French. They began to nod. We will go look for this thief in a cave by the forest, they said, and began to move out. Out on the heath in front of the castle, Sir Kenneth was riding his horse back and forth. The Servians came out of the castle led by Alex and followed by Charlotte. When he saw them, Sir Kenneth stopped. What is the meaning of this? Did you tell them what to do? He said to Alex. My laird, said Alex, Lady Charlotte speaks the French tongue. Well, what of it? said Sir Kenneth. Well, she spoke to them and explained to them their task, he said. Well, that's a surprise. She has a use after all. Charlotte, you will go saddle a horse and lead the men to the cave. She will do nothing of the sort, said Catherine, walking out the front door with a stern look on her face. Quiet woman, said Sir Kenneth, you have no business in my affairs. Nor does Charlotte, said Catherine. For goodness sake, this is war, and you are involving my young and frail niece. Have some decency, Kenneth. Kenneth advanced on her with his riding crop held above his head. I tell you to shut your gob, he cried. Very well said Sir Kenneth. Let us hope for your sake that they understood. He spurred his horse suddenly and approached Catherine. She stood defiantly in her place, and Sir Kenneth hit her abruptly across the face with the riding crop, sending her to her knees. The huge Servian saw this and ran to her, helping her up. Sir Kenneth, furious at what he considered insubordination, raised his crop again to strike the Servian. But this man, more than a match for the cowardly Scot, grasped the bridle and stopped the horse with one hand and snatched the crop out of Kenneth's hand with the other. Kenneth was taken by surprise and tumbled off his horse and onto the ground in a rage. Why, you blackguard, he shouted, only to be silenced by a mighty blow from the Servian. As he slowly got up, realising that he had set a poor example, he was silent, and the only sound was the sound of Catherine whimpering at the pain of the slash across her face. Let us all regroup and try our best to make sure our task is achieved, said Alex a little weakly. Sir Kenneth, still holding his throbbing face, nodded and led the way. Before he had gone ten steps, he turned and looked at Charlotte. Where is this cave? By the forest, she said, looking at Alex, who she assumed knew better. Gentlemen, said Charlotte to the Servian men in French, please follow Kenneth. They looked at her, hands on their swords, and she gestured to Kenneth, who was walking toward the forest behind the castle. He was humiliated and furious and was not looking at her. Charlotte watched as they headed off toward the forest, the opposite direction from where the actual cave was located, and smiled. As the Servians' mercenaries moved along, they swung their broad swords at heather, at insects, and at any living thing that was even remotely in their way. These people seemed less like humans than like beasts to her, although she had to admit that it was their intercession that had saved her aunt from a terrible beating. More than anything, she wanted to warn Colin about this new danger and help him overcome it or evade it. Chapter 14 Charlotte watched as the troop of soldiers followed Sir Kenneth into the woods and turned and ran as fast as she could to the seashore. There she found the cave and approached the opening of the place with caution, aware that someone, and she was still not who it was, had tried to kill her just the day before. 
Colin, she called carefully and as precisely as she could. She waited for a moment or two, and after a time she heard a noise from within. Charlotte, came a plaintive voice from within. Yes, tis I, she said. Very well. What is the news from yon Dune? asked Colin. The gallow glass are on the move. This sentence seemed to fill Colin with apprehension. He was not afraid, of course, because he was extremely brave, but he was also clearly worried that there were many people searching for him. I've been to the hame of some of the crofters around yon Dune, he said to Charlotte quietly and with great seriousness. They fear these men because they've already burned twa of their kinsmen's cottages. Yes, I had heard that. Were any of them hurt? Aye. Rory McLean was killed when he resisted these bloodthirsty ruffians. Worst away was that there was no talking to them, for they spake neither English nor Scots nor Gaelic. They simply drew their claymores and ran him through. But they are prepared new. And are they willing to help you? Aye, they err, although I do not think they'll be needed. We have this wheel in hand. Charlotte was astonished to hear this. As far as she knew, there was but one man, a woman, and a child dwelling in the cave, and they were certainly no match for the gallow glass Servians. Have you received reinforcements? she asked. Nay, tis but myself and Flora and we Angus, but we are proud and we know the land. My love, said Charlotte with concern, I have seen these men up close and I must warn you that they are bloodthirsty savages that know no honour or other kind of nobility. They will not discuss terms, and they will kill you when they see you. So what would you have me do? My love, she said with desperation in her voice, I would have you flee. Dear God, my love, your own prince fled to France. There is no defeating these people, for they are beasts and not men. Then we will hunt them, said Colin. Flora, he called into the cave. Flora emerged, blinking into the sunlight. What is it? she said. The gallow glass are in the move. We must ready ourselves for the fray. Why ha ye to arm yourself we? I am a quiver and a raise, she said with venom. Ah told you to wouldn't be guide news to let that Sassanac lass into our lair. Now are the furies of hell have descended upon us, and the battle's on. How many of these gallow glass are there? he asked. There are ten of them, said Charlotte, and to her surprise Colin and Flora both laughed. Tis but a wee force to contend with, he laughed. Charlotte was perplexed to hear this. But surely you do not think you will take down ten seasoned soldiers with bows and arrows like Red Indians, she said with some confusion. Ye speak as though the Red Indians were no some of the finest hunters the world has ear known, he responded. I know them for the tales of our kin who have been to the New World. The Scots are many of the same qualities that those peoples have with them. They know their lands, and they are their secrets, as do we. So fear not, my dearie, for twa Scots are mere than even odds against a band of unruly gallow glass. I told the mercenaries that the cave they sought was by the wood near the cliffs of Lochhusk, said Charlotte. Thou were very wise, said Colin, smiling. He put his hand on her shoulder, and Charlotte felt his warmth through her dress. He was flushed in the face, and she knew that his blood was boiling with the anger of the violence inflicted upon his people and his inability, until this time, to do anything to stop it. She also knew, though, that she had helped and given him reason to trust her. What will you do? she asked. We'll hunt them doon like the shern they are, said Flora and when she spoke she sounded fiery and angry and warlike. It made Charlotte shiver to hear her talk in this way. We'll take to the trees and pick them off as they blunder about the woods, she laughed. It'll be great sport. Aye to will, said Colin. He looked at her for a moment. A right, he said with finality, looking at Flora. We'll gang away. But Flora, will you have we Angus come wi' us, or will you let Charlotte mind him? Angus needs nay minding. The Sassanac has been a boon thus far, but I cannot trust her yet. Angus, she called, and Angus appeared scrambling among the rocks of the cave entrance. Ye stay low, and dinna let none of the Sassanac spy ye. Do ye ken? Aye, Mather, he said stoically. 
Flora, who was wearing the garb of a Highland warrior, with trues of the Maclean tartan and a woollen wrap around her chest, fastened with the quiver and the bow, leapt up onto the rocks above the cave and disappeared into the rocks above. Colin looked at Charlotte and smiled with the most loving look he had ever given to her. I've told you afore, my lassie, but let me say it again. You are a wonder. I never thought I would speak to a Sassanac lass, but Charlotte, you are a great boon to me, and I'll no forget. With that, he pulled her to him and kissed her on the lips passionately. His powerful arms embraced her and held her tightly, and her body filled with the wild passion that had become her main state of being since she had first seen Colin among the rocks and crags of the shoreline of Mull. Colin, said Charlotte, it was not you who sent that arrow at me as I departed, was it? My God, no, he said. Twas Flora. She had to be convinced to trust you, but I think you've done a boon to us with your information. I would do anything for you, my love, she said with passion. I love you, Charlotte, he blurted out, pulling her to his chest and kissing her passionately. This gesture stirred her loins and she felt the heat that had suffused Colin burning through her body as well. Godspeed, my love, she murmured. Colin moved away from her and laughed. I dinna need the Lord to send these queethin tay the divil, he said as he strode off in pursuit of Flora. Well, said Charlotte to Angus, who was looking at her with suspicion, I suppose we must look after one another now. Angus looked at her with disdain. The day I need a Sassanac lassie to gie me aid is the day I'll lay me doon in a graf. He spoke with such solemnity that Charlotte had to stifle a titter as she looked at the terribly serious young Scot. It's bred in the bone, she thought to herself. How many generations will it take to teach him not to hate the English? Chapter 15 Flora, called Colin as he made his way gingerly between the massive crags of Loch Husk to where he was told the gallow glass were hunting them. Where air ye? I'm Hitchty the Treen, she said in a voice so profoundly calm that he wondered if she were really speaking and not a spirit. Ah, can a spy ye, he complained, looking through the canopy of trees. The wood of Loch Husk was a windswept copse of old but somewhat tattered trees and the climbing had always been difficult. As he searched for her, he realised she had climbed into the high canopy where she knew the mercenaries would not look for her. She moved through the trees like an animal, making almost no sound at all. He was amazed at her agility, although he was equally adept in the forest floor. The secret, as any seasoned woodsman would tell you, was to avoid the twigs that could cause a snap or a rustle. He wore no shoes on his feet, and neither did Flora. But he could hear the gallow glass off in the distance, making noises that flushed grouse from their hiding spots, their hobnailed boots presenting both a danger to anyone who confronted them and a warning to avoid them. He whistled in the way they both understood, and Flora returned the whistle, indicating that she knew where they were and had prepared her volley to attack when least they expected. From the information she sent, Colin knew that she was about to surprise them with arrows from on high as soon as they were close enough. He knew this was a dangerous ploy because it would mean that they needed to expose themselves to draw the attention of the gallow glass. In the distance he could hear the stamping of their boots, as well as the sound of talking in their language. He was not certain, but he thought he heard arguing, and even someone speaking English. He crouched down by an old oak tree, and looked through a narrow break between two branches of the tree. There he saw the hated usurper, Kenneth Campbell, leading the gallow glass. It was clear that they had no respect for him, and that they were simply doing their jobs. He tried to get Flora's attention to indicate that she should kill Kenneth, and the rest of them would scatter, but they were too close to communicate. As he watched, Three arrows shot almost vertically from the trees, raining down on the unsuspecting Servian mercenaries. It was the leader, the man with the huge black beard who was hit first. It was a direct hit right in his left eye as he looked up. With a gut-wrenching shriek, he fell to his death, stumbling down an embankment and coming to rest with his head bleeding into a stream. Another man, a huge blond-haired monster, was the next to be hit. 
This arrow pierced him through his chest, and as he clutched it at the shaft, trying to dislodge it, the skin around his heart tore and shredded with a horrific tear. He howled like a wounded wolf and stumbled to his knees as the others watched in horror and confusion at the invisible foe. Alex, the Highland servant who was walking with the others grudgingly, looked around, and with some semblance of believability he shouted, Selkies! The Selkies are upon us! Although the gallow glass clearly had no idea what he was saying, it was equally clear that Sir Kenneth was struck with terror to his core. At that moment, the third arrow landed on the skull of another bareheaded gallow glass fighter, crushing his skull and causing him to fall backward into his comrades, who were befuddled and confused. There was a shouting in some foreign language, and Alex hid behind a tree to avoid fighting. At that moment, he watched Sir Kenneth skulk off into the shadows, leaving the poor mercenaries to face the unseen enemy. Just as pandemonium had broken out in their ranks and their leader had abandoned them, Colin leapt out from the copse of tree with his claymore unsheathed and swinging. He was a fearsome sight at the best of times, but the fury that was in his voice as he shrieked in time with the broad swath of danger cut by his claymore as it cut down several of the unsuspecting mercenaries. This claymore was a broadsword of four feet worth of razor-sharp two-inch blade that cut through the air with a sound almost like a shriek. As it laid into these poor men, they fell, wounded, without even the time to unsheathe their swords. As the soldiers saw him, terrifying as he was, at least they could see who he was, unlike the arrows that continued to rain down upon them from high above. By this time, two more had been hit, and Alex had fled. Colin had run two of them through and cut a terrible wound in the chest of a third, who was on the ground scrambling to get his footing in the uneven ground of the woods. Colin continued his war cry, and the fear in the eyes of these seasoned warriors was apparent to all. They had seen him, though, and he was among them, and so as they prepared to fight him in hand-to-hand -hand combat, he pushed his claymore deep into the chest of one, while another, observing that he was occupied and could not retrieve the sword for the moment, came at him with a yell. Colin crouched low as the gallow glass warrior came at him, and he pulled his small dagger, his sky and dew, from his hose and plunged it deep into the eye of the man who had been coming at him with his sword raised above his head. As the sky and dew found its mark, the sword fell uselessly on the ground, and Colin snatched it, using it to attack the only other man left to fight. This man was a brave and powerful Servian who had taken care to avoid the wild attack of the Highlander and managed to avoid the rain of the arrows. He looked with hatred at Colin, blowing from his nose like a bull readying for a charge. Colin looked him in the eye and saw a formidable foe. The others he had dispatched with ease, and there were now five soldiers lying dead on the ground around him. The Servian warrior advanced on him and threw a glancing blow onto Colin, who deftly moved out of the way of the huge sword. He had retrieved his claymore from the heart of the Servian mercenary he had killed moments before and used it to subdue this new adversary. He came at Colin with fury and anger of a man who had lost his best friend in the world only moments before for nothing and began a sword fight that was terrifying to hear for the clash of steel on steel. For more than ten minutes the two heroes fought bravely, advancing and retreating as was needed. At one point Colin was on the point of the other man's sword when he ducked and forced the sword into the oak tree behind him. Stuck there for a moment, Colin dodged through the break in the fighting and buried his ski and doob into the side of the Servian. He was surprised that the man barely registered this wound, other than his powerful roar of anger that roused him again. Seeing an opportunity to escape with his life, Colin began to run through the forest with the Servian in hot pursuit. At this point, arrows began to rain down in the gap between the two men, and the Servian, thinking perhaps that he was in a battle with the forces of black magic, abandoned the pursuit, allowing Colin to escape. After this battle, Colin, covered in blood from the slaughtered mercenaries, found a hiding spot where he knew Flora would be able to find him. She climbed down from the canopy of trees and looked at him, embracing him. That was a monstrous routing, she said, tears and laughter joining in her relief at the battle ending so quickly. Aye, but the coward Campbell fled, leaving the gallow glass to hold up the fray, said Colin. He's a wee timorous one. Aye, he is at that, 
said Flora. We have him and five other Galloglass to dispatch yet. Chapter 16 Left alone in the cave with Angus, Charlotte considered what to do next. She looked at the young boy who was moving rocks to create a barrier between him and her, and she realised he was frightened. You know, Angus, she said quietly, I am trying to help your uncle and your mother in this fight. There is only one right side of this battle, and I believe you and your kin are in the right. Aye, he said slowly. He nodded. Ah, know it. He raised his eyebrows. Man's no meant to dwell in a cave, he added. No, but that is not the only reason I believe you and your family deserve to have the castle again. Do you know much about the history of Scotland? Do ye? he asked. Charlotte was not expecting this and so she was caught flat-footed. She stopped for a moment considering how best to connect with the young man. I suppose you would be doing me a favour if you would explain the history of Scotland to me, she said, smiling. He frowned for a minute. Tis a complicated matter, miss, he said, nodding. You see, Scotland is a land given by God to the Scots, and it is an affront to the guide lord if a body were to take it from us. The Sassanach invaded our land, and they say, we'll no rest till they've subdued the will of the common. My mother tells me I'll know her rest till the Sassanach is routed. I want to abide in peace, but they will not allow it. So, we fight. That's the Scottish state of being. He said this in a matter-of-fact way that made Charlotte wonder if this person who appeared as a little red-headed six-year-old was older than she had credited. You are well-versed in your history, she said. That is admirable. Nay, he replied, tis but my destiny. For one brick day, this will be my fray, and I'm ready. Angus, said Charlotte, I truly hope you never have to fight. If there's a god above us, you shall have your desire. And was it matter to ye? he asked, and he said it in a kindly tone of voice, showing her that he was warming to her. I know injustice. Do you know much about me? Nay, all's I know's you're a Sassanac lady, coom to live with a usurper. You are right, Angus, and he is a brute. Only today I saw him whip his own wife with a riding crop, and he hit me as well. He is not a nobleman of any kind. Ah, Quida told you that, he said. The usurper is a Campbell, and since the ninety-two, there's been Nari a Campbell with a noble bone in his body. The ninety-two? Aye, Glencoe. Twas a massacre of the Macdonalds by the Campbells. Twas a bloody massacre because the Macdonald chieftain Archie was late in signing his papers, they say. And so, the English penned a letter called The Letters of Fire and Sword, and the Duke of Argyle, a Campbell, killed mare than a hundred Macdonalds. I'll ne'er trust a Campbell after that, he said solemnly. The memory of the Scots for injustice was astonishing to Charlotte, who, as an Englishwoman, was quite unaware of the larger political climate. To think that a wee lad such as this Angus Macfarlane could be so well attuned to the plight of his countrymen was astonishing to her. She had grown up around the minor English nobility, and never had a single child she had ever met known a thing about English history. Indeed, most of the adults she knew had little idea of why things were the way they were. She was impressed. You know, Angus Macfarlane, you are a very impressive young man. Thank you, miss, and you are a very pretty lady. She smiled. Although he was well versed in Scottish history, he was also very much a little boy. It occurred to her that he might well be hungry. Are you hungry? she asked him. She had brought along with her several of the meat tarts Mary had made the night before, as well as a few pieces of shortbread and some of her much-admired Strathaven toffee, a sort of tablet that was delightful, wrapped in a handkerchief she had tied in a bundle. She unwrapped it now and Angus approached with caution. I, I am, he said. Have you some meat? I do indeed. I want nae stinkin' fare for yon Sassanac mind, he declared. None o' your old skinkin' wear that jopes in luggies. He had a satisfied look on his face that he could conjure up such a beautiful description of his hatred for English food. I assure you this is all Scottish fare, she said, made by Mary Maclean in the Doon yonder. It is shortbread and Strathaven toffee. 
For the first time, the dour-faced lad smiled. Strathaven toffee, he said, and his face took on a mask of childish desire that warmed Charlotte's heart. The lad was still a child after all. She unwrapped the handkerchief and placed it on a flat rock between them. Help yourself, she said. Gingerly, the lad stood up and made his way to the rock to inspect the treats. And you say ah may have what ah like, he said, a look of mistrust coming over his face. Yes, it is for you, she said. I have a feeling you've not had this sort of thing for some time. Never, he responded, his tiny hand reaching out to take a piece. He seemed to tremble slightly as he put it in the palm of his little hand and slowly put his hand to his mouth. When he placed the toffee on his tongue, he took on a look of such rapture that Charlotte knew she had won him over. It's very nice, he said, his mouth full of the sugary treat. Have another, she said, smiling. Friends know how to share. He darted a look of confusion at her, but the desire for more candy stifled it quickly. He reached out again for another piece, and it was at this point that she noted how very scrawny the poor boy was. He had clearly been malnourished for a long time. So, no, you're my friend, he said, looking up at her. I am, she said, smiling. At least I hope I am. If you'll be gain me sweeties like this, you'll be a boon companion, Airmore, he said, reaching up to hug her. This gesture broke Charlotte's heart a little. This little boy had been starved for attention, for treats, for kindness for too long. It had probably been as long as he could even remember than he had not had a treat, she pondered. This is sweeter than treacle, he said, savouring the candy. In some ways, she felt as though she were being unkind to him and his family because she could bring him the sorts of things his own mother couldn't give him. But she needed to convince him she was on his side, and the Strathaven toffee seemed to be the way to his heart. His small arms reached to her, and as she knelt to meet him, she took him on her knee. He was no larger than what most English children would be when they were four years old and frail, yet strong. She put her arms around him and hugged him tight to her bosom. As she looked down at him, she could see the years of living in constant fear subside from his face, and the happiness of eating a sweet turn his face into a mask of contentment. The joy that filled her heart was indescribable. For several minutes the two of them simply held each other, giving a sense of safety and security for a short but very meaningful moment. And then they heard a rustling in the nearby grasses. It was not only the wind, and so they both scampered into the cave, hunkered down behind the rocky face that separated the inner cave from the outer cave, and listened for the familiar sounds of Colin and Flora. For what seemed like an eternity, the two of them crouched down in the darkness until they heard the familiar sounds of Flora and Colin coming back. Charlotta relaxed and took Angus's hand, leading him back into the light. Flora had not more arrows, and Colin seemed bathed in blood, yet somehow unscathed. You met them, I see, said Charlotte. Ay, and routed the usurper. We took Doon five of the gallow glass. Our work is no Doon yet, and ah, uh, said Colin. Even so, it is a good start, said Charlotte. Angus looked at his mother, who seemed almost as she had been before they left, and he put out his hand to her and offered her his last piece of Strathaven toffee. Flora looked worried for a moment. Where did you get that? she asked suspiciously. That Sassanac lass gave me it, he said, looking down. Flora looked at Charlotte. She took the piece and popped it in her mouth. Her face seemed to change and the taste of the delicious tablet changed her demeanour. Great Jesus, she said as though she had discovered the Holy Grail. This is heavenly. Mary McLean made it, said Charlotte, as a way of making her know it was all right to eat. We must thank her for it when we see her, said Flora, her face softening. That should be later today, said Colin. We have work to do. Chapter 17 Kenneth watched the mayhem around him and wanting to avoid a fight, he turned on his heel and ran for the castle. He left the Servian mercenaries to deal with the assault. Although he knew there were people fighting and killing his men, 
he had no nobility and no desire to show his cowardice to a broader audience. That bear must be rabid, he thought to himself as he scampered away, hearing the sounds of battle behind him. At some level he knew this was nonsense, but he was still unwilling to credit his own eyes. He did not stop running until he had reached the relative safety of the castle walls. Inside the castle walls, he sat and drank a large dram of whiskey and waited for the mercenaries to return. First was Alex, followed by five of the Servians, all much the worse for wear. He watched them troop into the Great Hall, and the Servians were trying to communicate to him in any way they could, indicating that it was a man with magical powers who overcame them all. What are these buggers trying to say to us? he said to Alex with annoyance. My lord, they believe they were assaulted by a man with magical powers, for they were beset by blows from high in the trees and a man who fought bravely and killed several of their number. Where are the rest of them? said Kenneth. They've met their maker, my lord, said Alex, his eyes downcast. What? Some warrior killed five of the finest soldiers money can buy? I can't believe that. It must have been a bear. Or a selkie, muttered Alex. Get your stupid superstitions out of my castle, said an annoyed Kenneth, downing yet another glass of whiskey. At the moment, Catherine entered the great hall and took a look at the mercenaries. Her face betrayed her horror. What in heaven's name happened? Never you mind, woman, shouted Kenneth as the mercenaries retreated without being dismissed. Where in the hell do they think they're going? He yelled at Alex. My lord, they will na fight the demons. They are soldiers, nay sorcerers. You get them back here. We need to rout this bear or demon or whatever he is. Alex, come back here. But Alex was gone. He was infuriated and turned his ire on Catherine. And what are you gawking at? He said to her. Kenneth, this is madness. It seems to me you are looking for a fight with something that has clearly overpowered these men. It is madness. Before she even got the last word out, he was on his feet and swung his arm at her. He hit he hard and she fell to the floor. It was clear that he had not meant to hit her. He was simply gesticulating. But given the kind of man he was, he tried to make it a justifiable response to her innocent comment. Get on your feet, you wench, he hollered at her. Catherine lay on the flagstone floor, weeping, partly out of pain and partly out of frustration and anger. Feeling his authority questioned, Kenneth approached her, and seeing that she was not getting up, kicked her in the stomach. She merely grunted and did not move. Suddenly the door swung open and a massive, fiery-faced Scot burst through the door. His wild red hair was tousled, and his tartan kilt and plaid were blood-spattered, giving him the aspect of a wild man. His massive arms were bare and powerful, like the muscled arms of a lion. He clutched a massive and deadly sharp claymore in his right hand and a sky and doob in the other, unsheathed, the cairngorm jewel on his hilt glinting in the candlelight. Kenneth looked up with a look of horror on his face. He clearly did not recognise Colin MacLean, but nonetheless he was terribly disturbed. Gee away from that woman, yelled the wild Scot. Kenneth obeyed, retreating to a corner of the room. Coom and fight like a man, you timorous, scurvy coward. Kenneth was reeling from the drink and the emotion of the moment, while Catherine lay on the stone floor, weeping. She didn't even look up, but Kenneth was retreating to fetch his sword from its place on the wall. Seeing a pistol lying on a table, though, he turned away from Colin. Coom and fight if ye hae any guts, you Campbell bastard, said Colin in a rage, approaching Kenneth. Seeing that Kenneth was reaching for his sword, he began to pace in circles around the room. I have no quarrel with you, you dirty crofter. Get out of my castle, you son of a whore. This is no Yadoon, said Colin quietly, sizing up his enemy. This is my family seat, and I mean to retake it after I've torn your guts from your weaselly flesh. Who the hell are you? asked Kenneth, turning to Colin, who was still pacing, expecting a sword fight. Kenneth hid the pistol in his hand behind a pile of coat that had belonged to the Servians and that were thrown on the table. Colin took his stance, waiting for Kenneth to approach. He noted that Kenneth had a sword in his left hand. Something was wrong about this. He knew Campbell was no warrior, but surely he knew in which hand he was to hold his sword. 
Take your place, you dirty usurper, said Colin, but before he could prepare for the sword fight, a shot rang out. He had not known that Kenneth had taken a loaded pistol, and so he was unprepared. The shot was loud in the hall, and it caused Catherine to rise from her place and run behind a large wardrobe. The bullet tore through the air and hit Colin in his sword arm, just above the shoulder. Although he knew it had hit him, Kenneth was taken aback that the Scot had not cried out. He was stoic in his shock. Thinking he now had the upper hand, Kenneth transferred his sword to his right hand and began to advance on Colin, ready to finish him off. He could see the blood spilling from his wound, but Colin seemed not to have noticed. Instead, Colin too transferred his claymore from his right to his left hand. This filled Kenneth with terror. The Scot advanced on his, and the clash of swords echoed off the stone walls of the Great Hall. The great hacking thrusts of the Scot with his claymore was quickly overpowering Kenneth, despite the fact that he was fighting with his left hand. What? Will you not die like a man? screamed Kenneth, advancing on him while leaving his side unprotected. Colin had put his sky and doob in his right hand, and he slashed at Kenneth's shoulder, tearing through his linen shirt, soaked with sweat and whiskey. The blood began to trickle down his arm, and when he noticed it, Kenneth blanched. You son of a whore, he yelled, advancing again, allowing Colin to make contact with his left arm and making him drop the pistol to the floor with a clatter. A fair fray is her, I ask, said Colin, but this is no a fair fight, for you are a swine and a coward to boot. He slashed again, making contact with Kenneth's neck, which began to spurt blood. Kenneth, sensing his end was near, fell to his knees and began to plead for his life. Spare me, you dirty Pict, said Kenneth. I'll reward you with land and riches. I want none of your stolen lands, nor your stolen gold, said Colin. He was waiting for a trick, having realised now that this was a ploy to take Colin off his guard. But he fell further, grovelling on the floor. Catherine, seeing her husband dying, ran to him to comfort him, and Colin gave way in the name of dignity and his own nobility. Kenneth! she cried, horrified at the blood that was spilling from him and pooling on the stone flags. Do not die. I need you. That slut, your niece, this is her doing, he yelled in a gurgling voice. That bitch ruined this place, he howled. But the loss of blood was too much and he died like a coward, lying in his own blood and filth on the floor of the castle he had stolen from Colin. Catherine looked up at Colin, expecting to meet her end as well. He stood there, nobly and powerful, his shoulders massive. The wound from the pistol shot was bleeding slightly, but it lent him an air of dignity, and it matched with the red colour of his plaid. Colin looked into Catherine's eyes, and he saw the truth that had eluded him until this moment. Her eyes were dry, for she had no tears for the man who had terrorised her for so many years. Why do you not weep for your husband? asked Colin flatly. Because, she responded, you have set me free. Chapter 18 It was in the afternoon that Colin, dazed by the dizzying series of events that had been transpiring through the day, made his way back to the cave. The idea that Catherine was also a prisoner of this sadistic Campbell was a revelation to him. He had considered this a fight against the English all along, and now that he knew that both Catherine and Charlotte were equally suppressed by this man. Even though both of them were Sassanacs, while the man himself was a Scot, a Highlander, was something he was having a great deal of trouble reconciling. He stumbled along the path, ears still pricked to the presence of the remaining Galloglass soldiers, knowing well that there were still enemies in the land, but suddenly the sound of birds in the trees and waves on the sea gave him the feeling of being in communion with the world. He saw that the world was returning to some kind of natural order. It made him smile, filthy as he was, utterly exhausted as he was, to know that his fight was no longer what he had come to believe was unwinnable. In fact, to some extent, he had won if the purpose of life was a life of purpose, as he had always been told. Baz no Betha, Gaelic for death of life, had been the slogan of Clan Maclean for five hundred years, since the victory with Robert the Bruce at the Battle of Bannockburn. 
and today, for the first time, there was hope in Colin McLean's heart, the beating heart of Clan McLean, the Marquis of Lochbuy, Laird of the Isles, the oldest and most powerful title in all of Albion lands. Although Colin was not often aware of the weight of his position in Scottish society, he was seized with it now. The position he had occupied until the Battle of Culloden, for only two years, Triathnan Ailean or Rig Inzigal, the Lord of the Islands, the King of the Isles, was one that had been held by his father and his father before him, stretching back to the days when the Lords of the Isles were nominal vassals to the Vikings. Of course, since he was a boy, he knew that his position in Scottish society was important. But until today, until the moment when he killed Kenneth Campbell, he had not fully realised that he was the hope of a long enslaved people, the lone shining light of hope in an otherwise hopeless land. But the realisation had given him hope, and the hope had empowered him beyond his human powers and provided a reason to fight and continue fighting until Scotland was free. The other realisation he had as he was walking back to the cave that had been his home for more than a year was that he was in love with a Sassanac woman, a member of the long-hated English race. But Charlotte was the woman who had provided him with the strength to do the impossible, to free his tortured land. He smiled, knowing that things had come to a head and been transformed. He was the Lord of the Isles now by long-standing tradition and now the blood of battle had confirmed his position through the weight of arms. He came to the entrance of the cave and entered silently. There, he saw a sight that he never dreamed he would see. Charlotte, with the young bairn, Angus Macfarlane, asleep in the arms of the Sassanac woman he loved. He was suddenly aware that things had transformed in his absence. Colin emerged from the shadows, rising up from behind a rock. I slew the usurper, he said simply. Angus rose, his face beaming with joy. How did you do it? he asked, his words floating from his mouth as from a dream. T'was a mighty battle in the great hall of the Dune, he said quietly, noticing that Angus was hanging on his every word. The usurper fired a pistol in a sword fight. He grazed Marecht Erm, he said, pointing to the still bleeding shoulder where the bullet had entered and left leaving a tear of angry flesh. But you didn't stop, did ye, uncle? asked Angus, fully awake and excited. Nay, I didna, said Colin, smiling at the wee bairn. The usurper didna know that I am equally adept with my left arm as with my recht, and so I tossed the claymore to my left and slew him. Colin could feel his face smiling and the feel was alien to him. He realised that although he had felt strong emotions many times in the past few years, he had never smiled. Not once. But today, after the usurper had been removed, he was once again filled with joy. He looked at Charlotte, whose face was inscrutable. I'm sorry about your uncle, he said, but he were a man we would pity. I know that well, said Charlotte, still betraying no emotion. He was a monster. He were a bastard I every way, he said solemnly. I spied him striking your auntie and I couldn't take it any mare. So I rose up and I struck him doon, we Maclaymore, as befits a boaty. And how is Catherine? asked Charlotte breathlessly. She is alive, but our ken nae mare aboot her, he replied. And the gallow glass are still aboot, are they no? asked Angus, rising up and preparing as if to accompany him into battle. For the battle is nae doon, fay the brither, he said. My mither is a wat to rout the gallow glass. Colin noticed that Flora was not there. And where is your mither? he asked Angus. She's gang away, with her quiver and bow, said Angus. She was here, boot once she'd made new arrows, and when the Sassanac lady had slept, she crept out to finish the fray. Colin knew this was a dangerous situation, as Flora was filled with fighting spirit, and she didn't know that Catherine was on their side. Nor did she know that the tide had turned in their favour. Can a coom wi you fay the brither? asked Angus, rising up to stand, looking every bit the warlike picked. Colin smiled with pride. I think we need to find Flora, Colin, said Charlotte, rising and coming to him. But I must dress your wound. We have na tame for thou, he said, taking her in his arms and kissing her passionately, giving in to the desire that had filled his heart 
since he returned to the cave to see her with the young man cradled in her arms. Charlotte kissed him back with a passion he had not expected from her frail, bespectacled frame. He knew at that moment that the fire of passion is theirs forever, born in exile and forged in battle. You're a fighting woman, my Charlotte, he said, taking her in his arms. I'll be your man if you'll have me. I wouldn't have it any other way, said Charlotte. But please, my love, let us find Flora and be sure my aunt is safe. There's no time to lose. Aye, that's true, he said, taking his claymore from its scabbard and cleaning it in the pool of water that had collected under the little stream. Les gang awa. The three of them set out warily, worrying about the gallow glass who still stalked the island, marauding and pillaging as was their wont. They made their way stealthily to the castle, which was looking much the worse for wear, its huge studded oaken doors lying open. The three of them entered silently through these doors and while they heard nothing in the rooms, they knew there was still trouble afoot. Colin led the three of them into the great hall, where the slain Kenneth Campbell still lay where he had fallen in a pool of his own blood and filth. The stench was overpowering. Father Brither, said Angus quietly, was the reek. That is the stench of death, my bairn, said Colin, nodding. He had no desire to give his nephew a taste for war, and this was a lesson he felt, a dreadful and ghastly lesson. Eyes awful, he said, but Colin could sense a slight tone of pride in his statement. This, though, was no time for a lesson in manners. There was a sound in the hallway. Do you hear? Lend an ear to that, he said. Charlotte was on the other side of the great hall by the table. She was moving things around as though organising or straightening things up in a way that struck Colin as peculiar. But he had no time to consider her motives, as suddenly a group of the gallow glass burst into the room. Angus leapt behind Colin, and Colin unsheathed his claymore and pulled his sky and dew from his hose. To Medved, shouted one of them, and the look on his face as he bore down on Colin was one of a strange sort of happiness or joy. It confused Colin who did not know whether this man was going to fight him or embrace him. His sword was unsheathed, though, and so Colin was aware of the situation, all of his senses tingling with anticipation and the need to protect his young nephew from this man. The Servian was a wiry man with a large, hooked nose, small red-rimmed pale blue eyes and missing teeth. He was not a fearsome warrior the way the others behind him were by his aspect, but it was he who was threatening. So Colin raised his left arm with the claymore, surprising the Servian, who had expected a sword fight in the usual right-handed way. Taking advantage of this surprise, Colin thrust his sword at the Servian, making contact with his chest, which, although it appeared as he was only wearing a tunic, clearly had armour underneath it, for the sound was of a muted metal clank. The Servian reeled backward but raised his arm, and Colin, who had taken a moment to ensure his young nephew was safe, didn't see the man advancing on him with his sword raised. There was a deafening blast from a pistol, and suddenly there was confusion in the room. Colin, who saw the gallow glass fighter bearing down on his nephew, sword raised, while Angus had a small sword and was preparing to defend himself hopelessly but bravely, moved toward them as he heard the blast. When he heard the report, though, he stumbled back, thinking one of the Servian soldiers had shot him. He looked at his chest and saw nothing changed. He looked to Angus, who had a look of great bravery on his childish face, and then he looked at the Servian, who was standing, stock still, reeling slightly. His legs seemed to have turned to jelly as he stumbled. Then Colin looked at his face and noticed that his nose had been blown clean off and the bloom of a bloody rose had appeared in place of his face. He looked behind him, and Charlotte was standing with a pistol in her hand its barrel trailing a small plume of smoke. She was standing proudly, her legs apart, her left hand pointing the pistol with a look on her face that betrayed her pride at having brought one of the soldiers down. Slowly, like a tree felled in the forest, the Servian toppled. With a terrible thud, his broken head hit the flagstones, and a huge pool of blood began to collect around him, mixing with the blood of Kenneth Campbell, who lay only a few feet away. Both Colin and Angus were confused. 
The other Servians, though, scattered, with cries that none of the others could understand. I never mentioned that I know how to handle a pistol, she said to Colin, a small smile on her face. No, you didna, he said, smiling. One, it's the bear. Chapter 19 Inside the castle, Catherine had gone to her bedchamber where she was packing her things, preparing to return to Yorkshire with her niece Charlotte, who had gone missing earlier in the day. Catherine was upset and not feeling right about anything. Her head was cloudy and confused, and every sound she heard terrified her. She was not sad to be freed from the clutches of her brute of a husband, although seeing him bleeding out on the flagstones of their home had filled her with a horror the like of which she had never hoped to feel. And as she put things into her steamer trunk, hoping against hope to find help from Mary, tears slipped down her face. She was a handsome woman for her age, and although the last few years had been unkind to her, she still bore herself with a certain nobility. The door creaked. Catherine gasped. She looked and saw the timid face of her faithful servant Mary at the door. Might a come in? she said in a frail voice filled with trepidation. Of course, Mary. I was hoping you would be here. Have you seen Alex? Nay, I have na, and I'm afeard. I don't blame you. Catherine was trying to give off a sense of security, that everything was going to be all right, but she knew that Mary knew better. The master, Sir Kenneth, she said tentatively. He's in the great hall, said Mary. She had a series of confused looks that were on her face. He has been slain, said Catherine, trying to maintain her composure. Aye, said Mary. Tis a pity. Catherine turned to Mary. Mary, I know you are not a servant. I know Sir Kenneth was a terrible man. Although, as a Christian woman, I wish death on no one. He was a brute and a drunkard, and I could not help what happened to him. He was slain by a great warrior, whose origins I know not, except that he was a Scotsman. He had red hair and was powerfully built. He fought with his right and his left hands. He was magnificent. So the legends are true, said Mary under her breath. Oh, Mary. This is no time for your fanciful Celtic legends of Selkies and Kelpies. This was a real flesh and blood man, and he slew my husband in battle. Nay, my lady, I'm no talking about no Kelpies of Selkies. I am telling about the Laird of the Isles, who was thought to be deared. I'm confused. The Lord of the Isles was my husband, and he is dead. Nay, my lady, your whose band was a usurper. There's no Argol in about that. There's no a single Scot who believes a Campbell can be laird of the Isles. Catherine stopped folding clothes and looked at Mary. Mary, she said, why did you never tell me this before? It's no more place to be telling Assassinach the history of the Gaeltacht. But don't you see, Mary, I am on your side. I wish no ill will on you or your people. And you are a Maclean, which means this is your land. I need to know this if I am to be amongst you. I ah, see that, my lady, but I ah, must see to the rest of the servants. Would you permit me to part? There was not really any choice for Catherine, as Mary had already departed. Moments later the door creaked again and Catherine turned, expecting to see Mary returned. But what she saw surprised her. I've come to finish you off, Sassenach, said the wild woman with the bow and arrow pointed directly at Catherine's heart. Catherine, in shock at this sight, stumbled backward and fell to the floor behind the bed. Get up, shouted the wild woman clad in the tartan. She was not wearing a dress, but a pair of tartan trues, tight to her shapely legs, and a loose piece of tartan woolen cloth covered her breast, which was otherwise covered in a buckskin tunic. Her red hair was wild and untamed. Catherine had fallen, though, and was unable to get up. As she struggled, Colin appeared behind Flora. Flora, what are you doing? he said. Ridden see Doon of the scourge of the Sassenach, she said with venom, tightening the bowstring. Belay, Flora, said Colin. She's not our enemy. You've been bewitched by the Sassenach lassies, said Flora, and took careful aim as Catherine stood up, facing her bravely. Charlotte was standing behind Colin, but Flora kept her eyes on Catherine. Flora, please. 
Catherine is my aunt, and she was as much hurt by Kenneth as you were. As we were. But Kenneth is dead. Your brother killed him. Please lay down your bow and arrow. I beg you. She is my only aunt. Although Flora kept her aim and a bead on Catherine, it was obvious that she was wondering if she was doing the right thing. Her face was not so sure as it had been only a minute before. You slayed him, Brither? Aye, I did. You can see him lying in his own blood in the Great Hall. Flora put her bow down and looked at Colin. You did him in? I did. God help me. Then suddenly she raised her bow, and as she made to let the arrow fly, Colin, thinking quickly, hit the butt of the bow with his claymore, making the arrow go wild. It lodged in the wall a few feet from where an astonished Catherine stood, expecting to be killed. When she saw the arrow in the wall, she stumbled forward, and Charlotte ran to her to protect her. Sheltering Catherine behind her, Charlotte turned to Flora. Flora, you know she is not your enemy. Please listen to your brother. You can make this work if you lay down your arms. We are on your side and want a restoration of the Marquisate. I care nothing for the Marquisate, she spat out, with anger seething inside her fiery soul. But I'll belay for the sake of peace. The truth is that she saw her son Angus, who was obviously upset by the scene, and her motherly instinct took over her warrior soul. Show me dead Campbell, she said to Colin with solemnity. Thank you, Flora, said Colin under his breath. Coom tay the great hall wi' me. He led her down the great staircase to the great hall, and there Flora approached the two corpses. Who's this? she said, looking at the dead Servian. Galloglass, said Colin. The tither is the usurper, he said, looking at Sir Kenneth. Flora bent down and examined him. He's a Curian in Dyth, she said with a hollow laugh. Aye, he's a Campbell through and through, said Colin. Just then, there was a disturbance in the hallway outside the door. Galloglass, said Flora, raising her bow, strung with an arrow. The door burst open and four Galloglass warriors entered, swords drawn. Suddenly an arrow shot across the room from Flora's bow, and the leader, a huge man with long dark hair, jerked backwards, with an arrow directly in his eye. The other two watched him in horror and began to advance on them before Flora could restring her bow. Colin unsheathed his claymore and advanced on the three remaining Galloglass warriors. Charlotte stepped back, pulling Angus, who too had unsheathed his small sword. Charlotte knew that, as brave as the young man was, he would not last a second in this battle. Angus looked on with great interest as Colin entered the fray, sword swinging, and taking the soldiers by surprise with his left-handed sword play. He hit one a glancing blow that tossed him toward Angus, who was still chomping at the bit to fight. The gallowglass arose and charged at Angus. To his credit, Angus was ready for him and dodged the attack deftly, but Charlotte knew it was not something he could sustain. She reached for the pistol, loaded it quickly and pointed and fired as he was bearing down on the lad. With a loud report, the gallowglass mercenary fell at Angus's feet. Ach, Charlotte, I had him, shouted an angry Angus. Charlotte smiled. I know you would have, but we have better things to do, said Charlotte, pulling the lad to her and reloading the pistol. Flora Wand Colin were engaging with the two remaining mercenaries, and although the battle was fierce, Charlotte had hopes that they would prevail. Flora was fending off one of the men with only her bow and arrow. Ah, need a claymore, she shouted, and Angus tossed his little sword to her. She caught it and used it to defend herself against the much larger sword of the Servian, who managed to push her away and rush to attack Colin, who was already in the midst of a furious sword battle with the other, larger Servian. As the one who had been fighting Flora came at Colin, he hit the man with the broad flat of his sword, square on the head, cracking the man's head open and spilling his grey, mushy brains on the floor. Angus was screaming in support at the top of his lungs, in imitation, it seemed to Charlotte, of the skirl of the war pipes of the Highland troops she had read about. Flora was back on her feet, and she ran to the dead man, took his sword, and approached the man fighting Colin. 
Colin had been stunned by the great blow he himself had laid upon the Servian and was not able to defend himself as the last remaining gallowglass looked at him with anger and fury in his eyes. Flora charged at the man and her sword clashed with his with a loud clang. It stunned her small frame, and powerful as she was for a person her size, the greater weight set her stumbling backward, with the Servian in pursuit, and Colin trying to regain his equilibrium. Charlotte could see that he had been winded by a blow, and we not able to regain his abilities at the moment. It was at this moment that the gallowglass chose to charge at Flora with his sword drawn, and raised it above his head. Charlotte had no more shot for the pistol, and so she was unable to stop this blow that would surely result in the death of Flora. It was as though time had stopped. Colin was looking around and seeing this moment when his family would be wiped out. Charlotte was looking on helplessly with nothing to help, and Angus, the youngest, bravest Scot, was running across the room to get his small sword and help. But he was too far away, and Charlotte knew that it would not help. She watched the sword rising above the gallowglass soldier's head and followed the trajectory where it would split Flora's head open. And then a shot rang out. Charlotte stopped. She looked at the pistol in her hand. It had not been her. Colin looked about, confused. Flora, who was preparing to meet her maker, turned to the side. The gallowglass soldier dropped his sword, and it clattered uselessly to the floor as he held his chest, which had a small puff of smoke emanating from it. His face registered surprise. He then had confusion painted over his visage. A grunt, a sort of animal gushing gasp, came from him as blood spurted from his still beating heart and his legs buckled. He fell to his knees, looking shocked. He looked at Flora, who looked confused, and then at Charlotte, who was befuddled. He looked at Colin, who was standing behind him. Colin stepped one step closer and ran the man through with his claymore, splaying him on the stone floor. What happened? asked Charlotte. You mean you didn't do it? said Flora, looking confused. No, I have no more shot. Then who? Suddenly from behind the wardrobe, Catherine stepped. Nobody had noticed her for a long time, and she was smiling, a smoking pistol in her hand. I've always been a crack shot, she said. But why did you do it? asked Flora. Because, said Catherine. This is your castle and no gallow glass will take your land ever again. Chapter 20 The following day, after cleaning the rooms and removing the corpses that were piled in the great hall, Colin went to the kirk nearest the castle to consult with the minister. The Reverend John Thorburn was the minister of the kirk of Lochboy. What are ye coom for Colin MacLean? asked Father John. Holy Father, said Colin with great reverence, I would beg a boon from ye. We are troubled we a number of corpses from the battle, and I would ask ye to help us bury them. Father John was perplexed. My Lord, I must say I am very happy to see your hame come into the dune. We ha' had a terrible time with the usurper, with his backmen burning yon crofts of the people who remained faithful to your rule, and many of the clansmen who have been displaced. It would be a boon to us, eh, if we could rid ourselves of the scourge for air. I agree, said Colin, but I would like you to find a time to marry us as well when we get leave to do so. Father John looked at him blankly. Mary? Who would be married? I, ah, would be, Father, he said. Lady Charlotte, the doctor of the Earl of Tremaine will be my wifey. Is she no the niece of the usurper, my lord? Aye, that is true, but she fought bravely to unseat the man, and well, of course I love her. Do you no know, think it unseemly to marry into the kith of the man you slew? asked Father Thorburn. Nay, I dinna, said Colin. She's no other kin of the usurper, for he was a brute to other people, including his ain wifey, Lady Catherine, who shall stay with us in the dune, and he was a Campbell. He paused, looking at the minister, who seemed to have no idea what this would mean. Will you do it? he asked. I'll have to ask leave of the moderator, of course, said Father John, but I would be prude to read the bands for the Tuar ye this Sabbath. I'll take ye you at your word. Thank you, Father, said Colin, rising to leave. 
In the coming weeks, the Maclean's of Duarte reinstated their place among the lairds of Scotland, and Lady Catherine, with the assistance of the Earl of Tremaine, who journeyed up to Mull for the occasion, petitioned the king to allow Colin Maclean, Marquis of Lochby, to regain his position, arguing that, for the stability of the country, it would be best that the rightful heir to the position should occupy the Doon, and that he should have all the rights and privileges of the position given back to him. Mary was restored to her position as a lady-in-waiting to the Marchioness Lady Charlotte, and she declared her love for Alex Maclean, who too had regained his position as a thane of the Marquess. The funerals were held at a grave site that was established to commemorate the bloody battle to unseat the usurper in a place by the sea. Sir Colin had a rood built that would announce and let everyone remember that peace had been bought at a price on the Isle of Mull. Darling said Charlotte, coming into the study that had been established so that Colin could continue his work. I beg your pardon for disturbing you, but I have the most wonderful news. Ah, Charlotte, there is no sicht in the world that ah would rather see than your bonny face. There's nae disturbing when it cooms to ye. He rose from behind his desk and come to her, embracing her with the love he knew would last forever. It's only that I have received word from my father the Earl of Tremaine. He and Mamma will be joining us for the wedding. Isn't that wonderful? Indeed it is, my love, said Colin. But there's more, said Charlotte excitedly. Do you remember when I wrote that long letter to Father telling him the story of our victory over the usurper and his gallow glass? Aye, I remember it well and you wrote it beautifully. Thank you, Colin, said Charlotte. You see, I wrote a fictionalised version of the adventure and sent it to Papa. He liked it, and I suppose he knew a chap who publishes books. This fellow was Mr Daniel Woods. He has agreed to publish it. Mr Daniel Woods has just written to tell me it is the most fascinating Scottish romance he has ever read. And it is by your wife to be, my love. And I couldn't have been mere prude, my love, said Colin. But there's more. The king had agreed to reinstate him to his position provided he take a vow of loyalty to the crown. He wants a vow of fealty to the Sassanac crown. I dinna think that will happen, said Colin. I think he wants to be certain you will be a good ruler, my love. It is here. Read it when you get a chance. Colin took the letter and laid it on his desk. But ye air a published writer, he said as he beamed at her, and a by telling our story. That is a wonner. Isn't it, though, she said, and they want another. I don't think I could make up such a story. Ah, sure you can. I've read your writing and you can spin a yarn as good as any tinker. The Sabbath day came at which the bands were read at the service, and Charlotte was amazed that the entire congregation pledged their support for the marriage between Colin and her. This particularly amazed her, because she had assumed that the wounds that had been opened by the Battle of Culloden only a few years past would be far too large to be closed by something as trivial as a wedding. But her amazement was not shared by Colin. Charlotte, my dearie, he said with a smile, what ye had to ken is that the Scottish mind, nay, the Highland mind, is a practical mind. We find the union of two foes to be the beginning of peace, as it has been for thousands of years. A great chieftain would coom to the hame of another great chieftain and propose his bairn to be wed to their lass. This is the way the peace has been kept for as laying as anyone here can remember. I grant you the Marian Assassinac would seem strange to a visitor, but abound the Highlanders. This is the way we work. Well, I am very glad they are this way, and I pledge to you the love of my life, in many ways my saviour, that I will love and support you for the rest of my life. Colin smiled at her attempt to adapt even her language to the Highland manner of speaking. Yes, must pledge too that you will learn the Gaelic tongue, for that would be the way to ensure a lasting peace about the people. Charlotte laughed. Well, my love, if I can learn the French tongue for as vain a reason as to attract some Londoner popinjay, then I warrant I can learn the beautiful Gaelic tongue. Mab her thu gaul dom gubrath mocholman, and wires in grad I chid mi thumaris toigli a moar he said softly. 
Charlotte was taken aback by this sudden revelation that the man she loved could speak what seemed to her to be flawless Gaelic. What did you say to me, me love? She said softly, as the service droned on into its second hour. I just said that if you will love me ever mare, my doe, then I will love ye like I love my healands. That is bands enough for me, she said, taking Colin's hand in hers. The wedding was equally strange and unfamiliar to her. In the world where Charlotte had grown up, a wedding was designed to be the most fanciful ball ever experienced in a young woman's life. The Highland wedding that she experienced was more like a reunion of good friends, as she later described it. Lord Edward Browning, Earl of Tremaine, was a very distinguished man and had a laugh that would fill the halls whenever he found something amusing. He still dressed in the old style, with his head bedecked by a large powdered peruke with sausage curls at his shoulders that trailed white dust wherever he went. He wore a beautifully cut dark blue velvet jacket with gold ribbing and brass buttons that showed a beautiful ruff at his neck. He wore matching breeches and white hose that displayed his thin legs to great effect. He had high-heeled red shoes on his feet that made walking on the flagstone floors quite difficult, and he was forever stumbling into his wife. Lady Anne Browning, who was also dressed in a most outlandish style from the perspective of the Highlanders who were her companions. She had a dusty orange-coloured dress made of a very soft and flowing velvet, and her décolleté was the talk of the court. In the windswept lands of Lochbuy, her greatly exposed chest was much discussed as both scandalous and quite likely to give her a chill. And so, while the Earl and she were walking the grounds, Mary made sure she had a warm wrap in Maclean hunting green to cover her bosom. Anne was a very charming woman, very vivacious and sociable, and the chance to meet so many colourful characters was a boon to her soul. I dare say, Lady Flora, she said, while walking along the strand one afternoon. The landscape alone of this island is enough to inspire one like the wonderful paintings of Mr Gainsborough. Ah, no noch de boot Gainsborough said Flora with a certain passion for her homeland. Boot, ah no, this landscape is very inspiring. It's caused many a fray and inspired many a lover to throw himself into the sea. This sort of colourful language was alien to Lady Anne, of course, and hearing such a passionate description of this seemingly barren, windswept island gave Anne a feeling of great inspiration. All her life, she had imagined the Scots living a life of desperation. Yet when she saw the way they interacted, how much the nobility would interact with the lower classes, she realised there was in fact another way to live. Something in her soul told her that her daughter had made the right decision in marrying this wild Highlander. Later that day, in making preparations for the upcoming wedding, Flora was in the kitchen making a haggis and hundreds of sweets for the reception. When Lady Anne saw what she was doing, she was taken aback. Oh my goodness, Flora, she said, you should not be a scullery maid. Surely you have someone who could take on this task without sullying your noble hands. There's a load of blayflum, said Flora, laughing. Tis well known that I mack the finest haggis in other Hebrides. That is a wonderful thing, but where I come from, a lady must no sully her hands with cookery. And where a coom fra, there's ni sich a thing as sullying one's hands for the people here lend a hand in time o' need. I dare say that were it not for me haggis and neeps there'd be ne wedding. Lady Anne was mightily impressed with the resourcefulness of Flora and told her so. Lady Anne, we Heeland ladies know no bounds when it cooms to toil. I dinna ken if your doctor told ya. Booter also slew many of the gallow glass wi' me bow and arrow. At this, Lady Anne was truly shocked. This was so unlike anything she had ever experienced that she simply could not understand it. I say, she said, no lady in my world would be seen in battle. Flora laughed. And I ah, would surmise that your doctor mistoot some of the tales she should have told you, for twas Charlotte herself who slew Twara the gallow glass. Good Lord, how could my daughter, recovering from consumption and mightily frail, slay a man? she asked in astonishment. At that moment Charlotte, who had just entered the room, looked at her mother and smiled. I am a dead shot with a pistol, Mamma, she said. Upon hearing this, Lady Anne fainted dead away, right there in the scullery. 
Flora, whose hands were deep in the innards of the haggis, leaped to her aid, catching her before she hit her head on the stone floor. Guy her space, Charlotte, said Flora, holding Lady Anne in her powerful grip. A few minutes later, Sir Edward was alerted to the commotion in the scullery. He appeared in great consternation. What the devil is happening here? Where is the scullery maid? he said loudly. You're looking at the scullery maid, said Flora. Edward looked around. What do you mean? I mean, you're either Helan's new, said Flora with passion, and there's no servants nor mistresses. We're a folk, and there's nay servant nor master in these parts. I see, said Sir Edward with a smile. I dare say this sort of non-conformity will never take off in England. You Scots are a frightfully resourceful people. But I shudder to think of my daughter doing the work of a scullery maid despite her title. I dinna see why not, said Flora. She's doing the work of a warrior. Flora sat Sir Edward down and told him the story that Charlotte had neglected to tell him about the final battle in the Great Hall and how she saved the life of young Angus Macfarlane. I'm dashed said Sir Edward. I never knew of the inner strength of my daughter. I had always taken for granted that she would be a frail and delicate blossom. I thought perhaps she might marry a dandy from society, but never did it cross my mind that she would one day slay a fearsome warrior. There's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip, said Flora with a wry grin. On the morning of the wedding, there was a mountain of delicious food prepared and dozens of the women from the surrounding crofts had descended on the castle's kitchen, preparing food and drink for the guests who were expected in the afternoon after the service at the kirk. I simply do not understand why so much has been prepared for the twenty of so thanes and ladies who are invited, said Charlotte to her mother over a cup of milky tea. You'll ken it in a while, said Colin, who was dressed in his Prince Charlie jacket and his dress Maclean tartan kilt with a massive sealskin sporran, bright shining black shoes with silver buckles, and handsome woolen hose into which he had inserted his precious sky and dew. I am simply prepared for anything, said Charlotte with a laugh. By this time she was accustomed to the strange ways of the islanders. They went all together across the heath to the kirk, Mary and Flora, holding Charlotte's train. Her wedding dress had been brought by her mother from Yorkshire, and it was cut in the traditional English style. Cut in a very flattering manner with a frightfully tight bodice and flowing train. It was made of a heavy brocade material with long sleeves and lace at the wrists and collar, and a deep décolleté revealing her ample breasts, something Colin had not expected to see until later in the day. He was mightily impressed at how beautiful she looked with her hair done in beautiful flowing curls piled in her head, and her spectacles banished for the duration of the wedding. Without her spectacles, Charlotte looked much younger and more beautiful than he had ever thought she could look. He found himself overcome with desire for her every time he looked at her, and for her part, Charlotte, who had been filled with passion for Colin since she first saw him, mistaking him for a selkie on the heath, and then later as a half-naked pict in her bedchamber, found her heart soaring whenever she looked at this man who had such great broad shoulders and a manly chest. His strong jawline was a constant source of joy and thrill to her beating heart, and as she watched him striding across the heath in the company of her father, a much smaller and frailer man, she was transported by her intense good fortune. This was a wedding unlike anything she could have ever imagined in her wildest authorial flights of fancy, but it transcended the dull, sublunary and prosaic expectations of the English gentry to such an extent that she found herself needing to pinch herself to be sure she was not dreaming. The kirk, by now a familiar sight to her, was bedecked with flowing banners and bunches of heather, and it looked more beautiful than she had ever expected. As she took her place at the front of the church, she looked at the pews, filling with every person on the island. Hundreds and hundreds of Scottish men and women, all dressed in their dress Maclean tartan attire, were there, and she confessed to Colin that she had never seen so many people in a church at one time. The place was bursting with crofters and sheep farmers, will millers and bakers, butchers and soldiers. The thanes who had survived the battles and clearances were there in attendance with their entire families, and the joy that filled the kirk was palpable. I believe I have entered a dream of my own fabrication, Colin, 
she whispered, as the minister Father John Thorburn began to intone the sacred words of the marriage ceremony of the nonconformist church. Charlotte had memorised her role and spoke the words as if in a dream. Colin, who was proud and overjoyed to be able to finally make her his Wi-Fi, could not contain his joy and laughed heartily throughout the ceremony. Laughter and merriment were the order of the day, and the solemnity of the ceremony was contrasted with the high spirits of the congregation. Mary and Flora were her attendants, and her mother and her Aunt Catherine were given seats of honour in the front pew, while Colin, whose best friends had been slaughtered in the battles, stood alone, proudly independent and noble as the minister read the rite. Angus bore the rings in a tray that had held the wedding bands of the Maclean's for centuries, as Colin had explained to her, and he was proud and stoic through the whole affair. Afterward, the entire troop of guests, wedding party and pipers, walked across the heath to the accompaniment of a band of Scottish pipers and drummers, swaying to the music of Highland Laddie. Although Charlotte had often heard the sound of a lone piper on the rocks by the sea, she had never experienced the thing the Scots call massed bands. As they walked back from the kirk, pipers and drummers seemed to come out of the braes, playing their pipes to match those who were marching ahead of them. By the time they reached the dune, there were more than a hundred pipers and drummers from all over the Isle of Mull, playing together in joyous madness. The sound was the loudest thing Charlotte had ever heard, echoing off the hills and crags. It seemed every single person knew every song, and many of the revellers sang along in Gaelic with the pipers and drummers. When they reached the castle, there was food and drink aplenty for everyone who attended, and no difference in rank between crofters, shepherds, thanes, or nobility. For the Isle of Mull was a place where equality was never preached, but always practised. Music was led by Dougal MacLean, a crofter who had mastered the fiddle, and the Scottish country dances began early on in the evening, led by Colin and Charlotte, who seemed to know just where to step, and to step lightly. Soon there were twenty fiddlers playing the songs all of them knew, and in the breaks between dances, singers would perform those peculiar tongue-twisting Gaelic songs, like one beautiful song called Broshan Lom, Tana Lom, a fast-moving melody that brought tears to many of the guests' eyes. The song that captured Charlotte's imagination, though, was a song called Far Ambi Mi Fin, performed to the accompaniment of bodran and fiddle. What are they singing about? asked Charlotte to Colin as he laughed through the song that was utterly alien to her sensibilities. Colin laughed. I'm afeard you'll call me a fool, he said shyly. I would never call you a fool, my love, said Charlotte, but do tell me what they are singing about, for it is the strangest, most compelling thing I have ever heard. She is saying, where I will be there is my hope, and there will I be, my hope I'll be there. In the next verse she is saying, travel into the beaches and walk into the sand. Where I will be, my hope will be there. I don't understand, said Charlotte. One of the things you'll need to coom to reconcile is that the Helander does not need to make sense. The life of the Helander is not logical the way you Sassanach see it, he said. If ye can coom to that conclusion, there's nay hope. Charlotte looked at Colin with confusion, and the longer she looked, the more he blushed. Ah, can I say mare, he said, and took her in his arms. When the assembled guests saw what Colin had done, they began to chant in unison something in the Gaelic tongue. Gab dubian bainse guse omar na bainse, they repeated over and over, turning it into a chant. Charlotte was confused. What are they saying now? she asked. They're telling me it is time to tack my bride to the bridal chambers. He blushed further. Colin stood on the table with a goblet of whiskey in his hand. As he raised his hand, he shouted, Gab glein uisge beatha agus toast gu ban nabainze. To which the assembled guests, with the exception of Charlotte and her parents and her Aunt Catherine, responded as one, Slap more. Then he leapt from the table and took Charlotte's hand. Tis tame to gang awa, he said. Charlotte and Colin made their way slowly through the crowd of hundreds of well-lubricated Highlanders and ascended the stairs to the second floor where the bridal chamber had been prepared. This is the moment. I've been awaiting them a life, he said. 
He closed the door, with the din of the festivity still ringing in their ears, and he approached Charlotte. Ma ein sweet love, he murmured. I have never wanted ye mare than I want ye at this moment. Charlotte smiled. Nor I, she said. He gently pulled on her dress as she unbuttoned the buttons that ran down the back of the dress. Stepping out of it, he gasped. What's the matter? she said in alarm. Nary a thing, he said. Coom te me. Colin was much faster than Charlotte at undressing, tossing his kilt to the floor and removing his Prince Charlie jacket and the silken blouse he had underneath. As he stood before her as God made him, Charlotte was overcome with passion. She moved to him and put her dainty hand on his chest, feeling the pulse of passion running through him like a lightning bolt. He put his hand on her breast, still rising and falling with tentative passion. She moved to him, and their lips touched with a fiery passion she had never known was within her. Their fingers entwined as the two of them stood like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He traced his fingers down her body as she shivered with an unquenchable passion that made her want to push him backward onto the bed. Instead, he gently lifted her naked body with his powerful arms and laid her there on the soft, downy bed and moved his naked body onto her, gently touching her all over with a soft and delicate touch she never imagined he could possess. And for her part, because she was overcome with the need to have him, she reached down his beautiful body and grasped his manhood in her tiny hand, feeling it firm and strong with desire. More gently than anything she had ever imagined, he entered her warm and moist cavern, filling her with the happiness she had held at bay for so many years, and the obvious fact that he desired her with an unquenchable need made her into a person she had never known she could be. She was like a wildcat, clawing at his shoulders as he thrust himself into her. She gasped with surprise at the never-imagined joy that he was giving her, making her imagination into the tangible present. His powerful loins worked hard to satisfy her, and she felt every caress and every gentle kiss with joy that she never knew existed outside of heaven. Colin MacLean, my lord and master, you are now the lord of my dream, she murmured into his ear. And you, the angel of a that hour, hold dear, he responded. You are the answer to every happiness I have e'er been denied. You are the missing half of my life in one perfect female body. Ah, love you with the soul of the braes and the passion of the locks. You are new and will be e'er more the lass of my dreams. Read the next story now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.